Carl Jung's concept of the archetypes is probably the most misunderstood and misrepresented idea in all of psychodynamics. They're spoken about all over the internet as if they were some kind of internal personified spirits with their own little personalities. An evil shadow, a radiant inner woman, a malicious death demon, a wise old man, things we should integrate and confront. Quite frankly, Jung would be turning in his grave if he could see what's been done to his work. This legacy of fantastical nonsense is not what he wrote, not what he intended, and we must say in his defence, not his fault. So many young men and women have had their own admirable spirit for self-discovery led astray by the scores of analysts and internet gurus who peddle this pseudo-Jungian nonsense. How many gurus have you heard of who encourage young people to confront their so-called shadow, to preoccupy themselves by moral necessity to stare into an abyss of darkness? Jung himself would have been appalled and wiped this away immediately. We quote from the fourth volume of his collected works, word for word. Young people who are very far from knowing who they really are would run a great risk if they obscured their knowledge of themselves still further by letting the dark night of the soul pour into their immature, labile consciousness. There are a lot of myths to put right. The truth is, Jung was a great pioneer. Like all pioneers, his work has needed to be updated since he passed away 63 years ago, in 1961. Again, like all pioneers, he made mistakes. That's expected and forgivable. What's not okay is to live in artificial unconsciousness of the man and the meaning of his work. Such a thing is a slight to the course of history and the future. Let's go on a journey, together, to show just how far our understanding of archetypes has moved on since Jung's day, with full respect given to him as a pioneer. For anyone who has tried to follow Jung, either for self-discovery or trying to put themselves together, you too share this same pioneering spirit. That instinctive urge to discover the psyche, and to go as far as possible into finding out what the meaning of life truly is. Along the way, however, we have to remember one crucial thing, which Jung himself stated very clearly. Thank God I am Jung, and not a Jungian. On our own journeys, if we're to truly live an authentic Jungian life, we should not try and copy Carl Gustav Jung, the man. This is the meaning of Jung to live by, to be directed by his living example, so we can do the same for ourselves, to become a truly authentic individual. That is, of course, individuation. This was part of the promise that my mentors, Steve and Pauline Richards, made to Franz Jung, Carl Jung's only son, in his father's house in May of 1992 to bring his father's work, Carl Jung's work, into the reach of ordinary people. Everything in this video, unless otherwise attributed, derives directly from Steve and Pauline's 44 years each of frontline clinical experience. We've designed this video, just like our previous one on complexes, to be like a hyperlinked book, with the comprehensive timestamps down below acting as the table of contents. Please feel welcome to allow your psyche to guide you to whichever chapter you feel most drawn to, and to jump around between them however you personally feel inclined. Or you could follow the whole story from beginning to end, whichever is most comfortable for you. The first chapter is all about the archetypes. It's an oft asked question, what exactly is an archetype? We'll answer this first using only and specifically what Carl Jung said that they were, with complete clarity, so that we have our foundation. From here, we will build into the updates brought to the idea since Jung's day, 
based on what we now know from neuroscience, genetics, paleoanthropology, and much more. This is represented by the psychodynamic of the meta-instincts, introduced by Steve and Pauline Richards. You can consider archetypes and meta-instincts true equivalents as we begin. The second part is the full ontology of archetypes or meta-instincts. So, what they are, in enormous detail, right from the informational foundations of the universe all the way up through physics, the genome, molecular physiology, the psyche, and into their specific manifestations across our lifespan. The third chapter explains exactly how archetypes or meta-instincts are activated. What specifically draws them into full manifestation? What triggers do they metaphorically look for? How does this differ in human beings from their equivalent in animals? The fourth part is an extended series of dialectics with Steve and Pauline Richards on archetypes in the real world. Firstly, on the platonic form of the feminine and the masculine in love relationships. Specifically, when relationships begin to go wrong. Then, the role of archetypes in orchestrating our contemporary geopolitics and cultural catabolism. What Jung originally called contemporary events. These historical times that we're living through might appear to be driven by politics, but this is just the surface. The real motive force driving the breakdown is to be found where genome and psyche meet. Then, Steve and Pauline discuss the role of archetypes or meta-instincts in PTSD, and the process used in psychosystems analysis to help someone overcome such a state. The fifth chapter is all about the ego, specifically auditing ego strength and our personal identity so we can receive the archetypes or meta-instincts in our own lives properly. Then, the final part of this video an extended series of writings by Steve Richards, which cover the entire bandwidth of everything discussed. You'll see an exposition on Plato, Darwin, Thanatos, Instinct, narrative stories, deep structure complexes, and much, much more. So, we are ready to go. Please feel welcome to choose a chapter now, or to take the journey with us right from the start. It's time to begin. Let's begin with Jung. What exactly did he say the archetypes are? The following is one of the most representative quotes on this, from Jung's Collected Works, Volume 8. Quote, Just as we have been compelled to postulate the concept of an instinct determining or regulating our conscious actions, so, in order to account for the uniformity and regularity of our perceptions, we must have recourse to the correlated concept of a factor determining the mode of apprehension. It is this factor which I call the archetype, or primordial image. The primordial image might suitably be described as the instinct's perception of itself, or as the self-portrait of the instinct. Unconscious apprehension through the archetype determines the form and direction of instinct. So, Jung is stating that we have instincts, and linked up with them, metaphorically as their self-portraits, we have archetypes, which have the purpose of giving a very specific shape or form to an instinct. He gives an example to make his case the highly specific steps a yucca moth takes in order to reproduce. Quote, The flowers of the yucca plant open for one night only. The moth takes the pollen from one of the flowers and kneads it into a little pellet. Then it visits a second flower, cuts open the pistil, lays its eggs between the ovules, and then stuffs the pellet into the funnel-shaped opening of the pistil. Only once in its life does the moth carry out this complicated operation. Such cases are difficult to explain on the hypothesis of learning and practice. 
Then, to finish, Jung writes, quote, The yucca moth must carry within it an image, as it were, of the situation that triggers off its instinct. This image enables it to recognise the yucca flower and its structure. This hypothesised internal image is, for Jung, synonymous with the archetype. Being innate and inherited, it recognises an outside scenario which triggers off an instinct, but also is viewable within, such as in dreams, as the self-portrait of the instinct. This is the core of his definition. Unfortunately, Jung very rarely spoke about this subject in such clear terms again. It is by no means perfectly defined, his use of the term image is rather vague, for example, but he very clearly links the archetype to an instinct, and therefore to biology. The vast majority of his subsequent work on archetypes, however, focused on their cultural representation, such as in alchemy and myth. Nothing of this kind, of course, is actually an archetype. They're collective images and narratives. Jung, however, saw them as representations of archetypal processes. So, archetypal images arising from the inaccessible archetype in itself. So, drawing a line of cause and effect, he stated that there were analogous psychological processes occurring in the lives of individual people to these cultural representations. His first and foremost case study for this was himself, his own psychology. To state clearly, the entirety of his archetypal theory was filtered through himself. This was a part of his personal myth, an idiosyncratic means of being himself, in line with his personality and character. He even says so himself, right at the very start of his memoirs, quote, Thus it is that I have now undertaken in my 83rd year to tell my personal myth. I can only make direct statements, only tell stories. Whether or not the stories are true is not the problem. The only question is whether what I tell is my fable, my truth. This is where we get the concepts of the shadow, the anima animus, and the self, to name the core set of archetypes, from. Jung's work, mixed with his personal psychology. If you are interested in knowing which specific parts of his life and experience gave rise to each of these concepts, you're very welcome to check out this Jung to Live By video on screen now. This is not a problem per se, Jung had every right to do this, but the truth is there's no such thing as a literal shadow or a literal anima, animus or self at least not in the way Jung literally described them. We want to be nuanced here. It's not that they do not exist at all, as in they're completely wrong, like saying 1 plus 1 equals 3, but rather any reality behind them, something so many people today are searching for, is buried underneath layers of mythologization and personification, without the man himself there to actually ask. More so than this, however, is when scores of Jungian analysts and pop Jungian gurus alike take Jung's truth to be THE truth, completely ignoring his stated advice to not follow him. Then we have a serious problem. The real domain of psychotherapy is supposed to be to help someone who is suffering. To take the psychoreductive bulk of Jung's writings on archetypes, based on his personal myth, and hence his psychology, and then tell someone who's in need of help to integrate their inner whatever, evil shadow, inner anima, devouring mother or tyrannical father, things which are nothing more than images generated by the culture, we have both a vast misunderstanding and an unacceptable, dangerous trap. Fantasy images generate suggestion. As Steve and Pauline have said, suggestion equals influence. Undue influence, especially with such constructs, generates iatrogenic harm. That is, a new problem is introduced where it never existed in the first place. So, 
is there anything of value in Jung's original archetypal hypothesis? To hold it to the same standard as any other hypothesis, then by default, no. Not unless it can prove itself to be real and useful. For that, we have to return back to first principles. To inform us on this, it's very interesting and important to know that Jung's concept of the archetype has a very long cultural genealogy all the way back to classical Greece. In particular, Plato's affective intuition of the Platonic form, or Platonic idea, which we've spoken on at length in other videos on Jung to Live By, and which are discussed in great detail later on today. Indeed, Jung acknowledged his debt to Plato, writing, quote, Archetypes are active living dispositions, ideas in the Platonic sense, that preform and continually influence our thoughts and feelings and actions. Immanuel Kant, another influence on Jung, as well as Freud, and Conrad Lorenz, who we will mention later, intuited something very similar, with his description of the a priori intuition structuring our minds, akin to broadly an unconscious, with specific dispositions, and the existence behind our perceptions of the thing in itself, akin to Jung's concept of the archetype in itself. Freud, too, intuited something similar in his concept of archaic remnants, or archaic heritage, writing, quote, What may be operative in an individual's psychical life may include not only what he has experienced himself, but also things that were innately present in him at his birth. Elements with a phylogenetic origin, an archaic heritage. Freud continues a little later, quote, the archaic heritage of human beings comprises not only dispositions, but also subject matter, memory traces of the experience of earlier generations. Freud continues still, quote, If we assume the survival of these memory traces in the archaic heritage, we have bridged the gulf between individual and group psychology. We can deal with peoples, as we do with an individual neurotic. Freud sums up his version of what could be called a phylogenetic psyche, to borrow a term from Dr. Anthony Stevens to describe the Jungian collective unconscious, succinctly in the following quote, Dreams and neuroses seem to have preserved more mental antiquities than we could have imagined possible, so that psychoanalysis may claim a high place among the sciences, which are concerned with the reconstruction of the earliest and most obscure periods of the beginnings of the human race. So all of this is to say that Jung's archetype has a long history behind it. The core of the intuition, if we were to distill it from Jung's personal psychology, is very much real. The popular construct elaborations on from it as found all over the internet and espoused by many Jungian analysts, however, are not. Where does this leave the idea then? It is now where we can bring in the meta-instincts. Introduced by Steve and Pauline Richards, the meta-instincts are a significant revision on from Jung's intuition of the archetype, sharing the same cultural genealogy all the way back to Plato. It would be wrong to state that they are the same, as we hope this video will make clear, but they are certainly psychodynamic equivalents. Where Jung essentially stated that archetypes are simply inherited anticipations for certain events and situations, the meta-instincts cover the exact same ground, and then go much further, incorporating updates since Jung's day in the fields of neuroscience, genetics, paleoanthropology, physics, and many, many more. Let's take an odyssey together. Starting right from the first principles and foundations of the universe, working our way up to what meta-instincts, and therefore archetypes, really are. Steve describes the meta-instincts in IPSA Collected Works Volume 1 as the following. The meta-instincts are specifically human instincts that have developed via the evolution of the human brain, 
the genome, and its associated fields, to meet the challenges of advanced culture and complex social behaviour. This gives us our orientation point. Meta-instincts are specifically human social instincts. They have informational representation in biology, psychology, and the social world, all as discrete superpositioned waveforms of the overall objective waveform of information. In case you haven't seen our Terminal Lucidity Rebirth series, it's worth explaining what this means, as it will become crucial later on. As the core framework of psychosystems analysis, Steve and Pauline built on the work of Professor George Engel, the founder of the biopsychosocial medical model, with his personal support to do so. Engel's original, from his very famous 1977 paper, The Need for a New Medical Model, A Challenge for Biomedicine, was a framework that described the totality of a person as being represented by interacting biological, psychological and social factors. All need to be considered when making a biological or psychological assessment of a person. Steve and Pauline's development on from Engel is represented by their psychosystems continuum. It has each resolution of the stack fully listed, with a comprehensive Jungian-based psychodynamic model represented by both the ontogenetic and phylogenetic components of the psyche, in place of Engel's original psychology, or as he called it, person, box. More so than these, however, is their introduction of both their informational monism and superposition theory into the framework. Informational monism states that everything, literally everything in the world, is at base just a certain representation of information. First formulated by Steve and Pauline in 1988, informational monism is very similar to information theory in physics, represented perhaps most famously by John Wheeler's idea of it from bit, among others, which has become one of the most popular frameworks for understanding the nature of the material world. Usually, when we think of matter, we take the mindset of the atomos, the ancient Greek term for indivisible. Cells are made of molecules, molecules of atoms, atoms of subatomic particles, and so on, until we reach the indivisible, what particle physicists term the elementary particles. These cannot be subdivided any further, and in fact, as Sir Roger Penrose points out, can only be described in terms of mathematical variables, rather than anything physical. Information theories hold that this is only true as an artefact of the methodology, and our perception. Instead, metaphorically, beneath matter is information, which, again metaphorically, gives rise to matter. We can observe the properties of matter, but its underlying substrate is information, the true atomos, or indivisible. In psychosystems analysis, information is defined as literally that which informs. It is the fundamental substrate of everything. Hence, at the base and outside of this continuum is informational monism. This informational monism is superpositioned across the entire continuum to form the objective waveform of information. It's worth going into some definitions here. As Steve writes, superposition in this context refers to, quote, how the same information is represented at various levels of the biopsychosocial stack. An example is a complex that has representation at several different biopsychosocial systems levels. Each such systems level both represents and defines the complex within level. This means that the information that makes up the essence in itself of the complex is determined by the system level that represents it. 
For example, a somatic symptom profile of a complex both expresses and determines how the informational content of the complex is revealed. That same complex may also be represented psychologically or psychosocially according to the properties and bandwidth of those classifications of systems. The objective waveform, then, is synonymous with all superpositioning information, representing everything, from the informational monism into all matter and fields in the universe. From the example just given, the specific waveform of a complex, or indeed any other psychodynamic, including meta-instincts, describes only a part of the objective waveform, which is always in dynamic relationship with it. If we were to describe a complex by simply its somatic symptom profile, as Steve mentioned in the example, then we would de facto be describing our own subjective waveform. In contrast to the objective, the subjective waveform of individual, reflexive, self-referent psychological consciousness is the collapse of the objective waveform into immediate subjective awareness. The most obvious example of this is sensation. Specialised receptors in our body pick up on certain types of information, so light, sound, touch, etc., which travel through the nervous system, towards the brain, and become a representation within ego consciousness, so our sight, hearing, etc. Information outside the ego becomes informational representation within the ego. Information can also enter into the subjective waveform of the ego through another qualia too, intuition. Intuition carries information from the objective waveform rather than directly through the senses. Jung originally described it as perception by way of the unconscious, but really we know today that it is much better classified as perception by way of the overall field of information. This definition prevents us from collapsing into a closed definition of what the so-called unconscious is. More on that in a moment. Information moving into the ego on the carrier wave of intuition then collapses into a specific representation as either cognitive, affective, sensory or somatic representation. Intuition cannot represent itself to the ego directly. It always collapses into one of those other four. If we zoom back out again, we can see that the subjective waveform is the result of dynamic superpositioning of the objective waveform into the evolved architecture of the ego. So we can only ever see, perceive and aperceive a limited representation of everything that there is. Understanding this crucial point that our subjective waveform is only ever a superpositioned representation is essential for understanding meta-instincts, as it gives us an immediate framework to relate to them. Most of the time, which is very normal, our subjective representation is filtered through those complexes which represent our memory, learning and self-referent identity. In fact, it is this waveform collapse which allows us to make the distinction between different levels of the continuum in the first place. We don't perceive the information directly, but instead it's representation within ego consciousness. Whether that's through sensory perception, generation of a cognitive idea, or feeling of a certain emotional state. Meta-instincts, then, have a specific collapse of analysis, description and explanation, here within the continuum. But, like everything, are superpositioned at many levels of the stack. When they collapse into the subjective waveform of the ego, they first of all superposition themselves into intuition, which then collapses into, most usually, affect. That is, we literally feel them. 
not think about them. We can then reflexively see their further superpositioning into the social world, in immediate relationships, and the dynamics of the culture at large. So, to return to Steve's baseline definition, the meta-instincts are specifically human instincts, which in terms of information and superpositioning look like this. That have developed via the evolution of the human brain, the genome and its associated fields to meet the challenges of advanced culture and complex social behaviour. To explore this second half of Steve's definition, let's continue to build up our ontology. Informational monism is projected, using that word metaphorically, into superposition with the material universe at the resolution of the Planck scale. This is the smallest dimension of space-time geometry. This fundamental field of information is called the Platonic field. This is the meta-field of the objective waveform, the ontological, organising and informing field of superpositioning information. Or, in short, informational monism meets the material universe. When it does, it forms the platonic field. This platonic field then orchestrates the dynamics of the previously mentioned objective waveform. But what does this mean? Well, all superpositioning information, so all of matter, biology, the psyche, the dynamics of the social world, etc., has its a priori imprint, or form, within the platonic field. In other words, the platonic field anticipates everything which is superpositioned out from it. This is why Steve and Pauline gave it that name. It's really very similar to Plato's original intuition of the world of forms, that everything in the material world has a superordinate form, which acts as the template for its physical properties. Modern physics can certainly be demonstrated to lend credence to this intuition. Nobel laureate Sir Roger Penrose has stated that mathematics seems to be as if platonic. Everything in the material world relies on mathematics for its existence, and yet mathematics is not in the material world at all. It seems to be as if separate, and also superordinate to it. Specifically, mathematical nomenclature is, of course, invented, but the existence of mathematical truths, like E, I, Pi, and Pythagoras' theorem, is discovered, innate and unchanging. Mathematics is very likely a superpositioned representation of the Platonic field. So too are the fundamental properties of elementary particles, like charge and spin, which seem to simply be innate to the universe. But there are other representations too. We'll cover these later in the video. Continuing our ontology then, superpositioned out from the platonic field come two types of field, physical and Sheldrakean. The physical fields are currently the most well described, being the traditional domain of physics and chemistry. These begin with the elementary particles, which are identical everywhere in the universe, being physical collapses of the overall electron field, or quark field, etc. These elementary particles interact through the fundamental forces to produce composite particles, which interact to create atoms, through to molecules, and then for our purposes today, all the molecules of biochemistry. At the same time, superpositioned with these physical fields are the Sheldrakean fields, named after the work of Dr. Rupert Sheldrake. Dr. Sheldrake has demonstrated through observation, deduction and experiment that the universe appears to contain a certain type of field responsible for what he terms formative causation. That is a certain type of cause and effect, not using, for example, Newtonian force to move energy from one place to another, but instead a field relationship that allows for instantaneous sharing of information, irrespective of physical distance, between things of the same form. 
In Sheldrake's view, the so-called laws of the universe are not unchanging laws at all. Their appearance as such is an assumption made by many natural scientists that the properties of matter have always been constant, when technically we have no direct observation that this is true. We weren't there at the so-called Big Bang, for example, and thus our presumption about how matter behaved back then, although based in direct observation of red shifting, the cosmic microwave background radiation, etc., still nevertheless relies on the technically metaphysical assumption that the relationship between things is always constant. Instead, for Sheldrake, these so-called laws are more like habits. In many cases, such as the forces bonding atoms together, very strong habits that are highly unlikely to ever change, but habits nonetheless. This view sees form as imminent with material existence. Does there appear to be a contradiction here? We've just stated that there's a platonic field, the prime causative field of information that produces the ontology of the material world, but also Sheldrakean fields, which sees no Napoleonic code for form. How can both be true? Steve and Pauline have syncretized both views together. As Steve writes, quote, the platonic field is the foundational and primary causative field, which has within it the embedded ontological dynamic that brings the Sheldrakean into being. Sheldrakean fields, formative and behavioural, interact dialectically with the platonic field, so that the platonic field itself can and is updated by ontological feedback. To give an image to illustrate this, human nature, so let's say our instincts, is a form anticipated a priori to an individual lifespan by the platonic field. This is simply to say that our nature is innate and evolved, not a blank slate. What the population of human beings does with its shared bandwidth of possible adaptations, however, is picked up by and stored within the Sheldrakean fields, which mark the collective habit strength of certain forms of psyche through to behaviour superpositioning. This then doesn't just remain as a Sheldrakean field, but loops back down to the platonic field and updates it. Meaning that the habits of the collective become predispositions within the a priori bandwidth of possible adaptation. Meta-instincts, then, have informational representation in both the physical, broadly speaking our psychobiology, and the Sheldrakean. To highlight, this means two key things. That group meta-instincts possess a degree of habit strength, which spreads between individuals as a field, as per our current cultural catabolism, more on this later, and that meta-instincts, through dialectical interaction between the Platonic and Sheldrakean, have a representation directly within the Platonic. For example, Jung's Anima Animus. Also, more on this later. With all of this said, let's continue our ontology of meta-instincts by returning back to psychobiology. The most fundamental of all biomolecules to focus on is, of course, the genome. That piece of us which is passed through the generations, all the way through evolutionary time. Let's define the genome for our purposes as the compact, material store of biopsychosocial adaptive potential, which consciously directs the ontology of the lifespan, both on timed release and in dynamic relationship to the environment. It's clear that the human lifespan forms a distinct arc, from conception to birth, through childhood, adolescence, adulthood, middle age, and old age. Each of these brings with it distinct, programmed biological changes for the person, which superpositions itself into changes in psychology 
and psychosocial relating. All of this is orchestrated by the genome, consciously. By consciously, we don't mean that it has a phenomenological awareness of what it is doing, as a little personality. No, Steve and Pauline define consciousness as a superpositioned phenomenon, consisting of many different, simultaneously present, complexities of information that each, and taken as a whole, represents itself to itself, and itself to other complexities of information. Our reflexive self-aware ego-consciousness is but one variant of consciousness, but it is always superpositioned with the other forms of consciousness, the genome being one of them. The genome certainly has a form of sentience. From a molecular perspective, this is absolutely clear. On its own, it doesn't do anything. When in its cellular context, however, it will dynamically switch transcription on and off, depending on the molecular signals it receives. These signals are enormous in their potential variance. We know from the work of Professor Ernest Rossi exactly how information from the psyche, including that pertaining to complexes, transduces through the body via discrete biological pathways. Neurotransmitters, neuropeptides and hormones secreted from the brain and central nervous system act as messenger molecules which modulate the activity of the autonomic nervous system, the endocrine system and the immune system, to name only three. This works both ways too, from psyche to soma and from soma to psyche, modulating genomic transcription along the way, broadly either towards biopsychosocial homeostasis or state encoding complexes, what Rossi would have termed state-dependent memory, learning and behaviour. Steve and Pauline also contributed the acid-base balance of the body to this list of psyche-soma transduction pathways. In fact, it is the most potent of them all, which we discussed at length in our Complexes – The Ultimate Guide video. Regulated both by pulmonary ventilation and biochemically within cells, the acid-base balance of the blood is a very strong potential whole system state encoder of complexes, with superpositioned representation in the global genomic transcription profile in every single system in the body, including, first and foremost, the brain. All of this translates to, metaphorically, the genome being very capable of making a huge number of choices, depending on its context informational input from the rest of a person's biology, their psychology, and their social relationships. These choices are naturally homeostatic, but we must also remember they can be co-opted and parasitized by maladaptive complexes, metaphorically self-reproducing, like a virus, from the transcriptional activity of the genome as fuel to keep them being expressed. Biologists have identified many of those genomic choices, or as Steve and Pauline describe them, from a full biopsychosocial perspective, anticipations. Dr Eric Goodwin, also an essential figure of our new paradigm, has highlighted the lac operon as an example of this, whereby a bacterial genome dynamically adapts itself to the presence of the sugar lactose in the environment, when glucose is not available as a fuel source. Naturally, it prefers glucose, but when glucose isn't there, it either has a choice – die or use lactose instead. The inbuilt anticipation of there possibly being lactose in the environment is therefore crucial for its adaptive potential. Hence, this anticipation was selected for by evolution. When it comes to the human psyche, however, these genomic anticipations are best described at the crossover point between the disciplines of biology and depth psychology, 
not biology on its own. So, how the genome and a psychodynamic, so-called unconscious, interact to direct our lifespan. Some of these anticipations are context-dependent, others are on timed release from the genome. It is here where meta-instincts enter the story. Let us begin at the beginning, birth. When we are born, we have very specific genomic anticipations, superpositioned into meta-instincts, that are already gearing up for immediate release. We could describe these very broadly as attachment to a caregiver, usually the mother. Before going any further, let's bring in the work of the late Dr. Anthony Stevens, a leading Jungian analyst, psychiatrist, evolutionary psychologist, and internationally respected author. He personally supported Steve and Pauline's development of psychosystems analysis, and for his pioneering work of bringing Jungian psychology in line with evolutionary biology, Steve and Pauline have called him the father of the new paradigm. In March of 2023, Dr. Stevens restated his support for Steve and Pauline's work. Quote, my dear Steve and Pauline, what a wonderful 90th birthday present you have brought me. I was deeply touched, humbled and grateful for the heartfelt feelings of support and appreciation which, thanks to you, came flooding into me from all over the world. At my time of life it is immensely reassuring to know that my work is not forgotten and that understanding of the evolutionary roots of archetypal psychology will be carried on and developed by future generations of psychologists. Thank you, dear Steve and Pauline. You, Eric, and your students are doing a great work which will contribute to the survival of humanity. And as I approach the final years of my life, it is a comfort to know that this vital work is in such capable hands. With love and my deepest thanks, Anthony. Dr. Stevens describes in his landmark 1982 publication, Archetype, A Natural History of the Self, that through to the end of the 1950s, practically all psychologists, psychiatrists and psychoanalysts held the view that infant attachment was learned through a form of operant conditioning. Most pertinently, that providing food was the primary means through which a child would become attached to a caregiver. In 1958, British psychiatrist and psychoanalyst John Bowlby published a paper which stated a very different view, that children become attached to their mothers through instinct, not via learning. Beginning in 1966, through a research project on infant attachment at the Matera Baby Centre in Greece, Anthony Stevens confirmed Bowlby's theory for himself. Children at the Matera were raised by many, many different nurses. They didn't have a single mother figure. So Dr Stevens raised the hypothesis, if the academic psychologists were right, then the children should exhibit no specific attachment to one specific nurse. If Bowlby was right, however, then the opposite should be true. Indeed, Dr Stevens confirmed that the latter was the case. Despite having no single mother figure, the children all became attached, most strongly, to one specific nurse. When he asked those nurses how that came to pass, they all replied, invariably, that it was love which was responsible. For them, attachment was not attachment at all, but an affective, lived experience. Parallel to this, in the 1960s and 70s, the field of ethology, that's the study of animal behaviour, experienced a rapid and successful rise, represented by the work of Conrad Lorenz, Nico Tinbergen and Carl von Frisch, among others. In ethology, animal behaviour is viewed as an evolutionary adaptation. That is, whatever certain species typically do is a product of their ancestors having been under selective pressure 
to develop such behaviours for adaptation. These adaptations are inherited via the genome and form discrete neurological representations which can be activated under the right conditions. Whenever a certain sign stimulus, as it's called, is present, it has the capacity to trigger a specific innate releasing mechanism, which releases and coordinates the instinctively determined patterns of behaviour. Anthony Stevens uses many examples to show this in effect. Here's one of them. Quote, a male robin will recognise and attack any rival entering his territory. What perceptual qualities must the rival possess in order to elicit this hostile behaviour? The answer is, quite simply, a red breast. That it is specifically the red breast which releases the aggression is clear, from the observation that a male robin without a red breast is not attacked, while a crude bunch of red feathers, provided it is displayed within the subject's territory, is. Importantly, these patterns of behaviour are innate, not learned. The recognition of the sign stimulus is inherited via genomic and neurological representation of an innate releasing mechanism, which has the purpose of releasing an instinct, behaviourally, into the world. Building on from his research on instinctive infant attachment behaviour, Anthony Stevens noticed that this work from the ethologists on animals was very similar to what Jung described about the core feature of the archetypes. Jung writes, quote, The instincts form very close analogues to the archetypes. So close, in fact, that there is good reason for supposing that the archetypes are the unconscious images of the instincts themselves. In other words, they are patterns of instinctive behaviour. Syncretizing all three of these together, his research on attachment, ethology, and Jung's archetypal hypothesis, Anthony Stevens's updated model of archetypes was as such. A sign stimulus in the environment, such as playing with a caregiver, is apprehended by the archetype, analogous to the innate releasing mechanism, which then triggers off an instinct, such as so-called attachment. This is the exact same process in animals and in humans, but the archetype had one key difference for Dr. Stevens over the innate releasing mechanism of ethology, its affective component. Where the ethologists looked purely at behaviour, Anthony Stevens recognised that the archetype has two poles, so to speak, the biological instinctive side and the psychological experiential side. Nevertheless, ethology had given a new grounding for Jung's archetypes, one rooted in the very real empiricism of animal behaviour, evolved through natural selection. To use Steve and Pauline's framework, it's very clear to see that the meta-instinct, or so-called archetype, is superpositioned across many different informational representations. It is anticipated by the genome, has representation within ancient phylogenetically conserved regions of the brain, forms neuropsychologically an innate releasing mechanism, is affectively felt via subjective waveform collapse, such as the love and joy a mother and child share, just as some key examples. One of the key differences from Dr. Stevens's model, however, is that instead of the sign stimulus activating an innate releasing mechanism, it's the other way around. The innate releasing mechanism actively seeks out the corresponding sign stimulus. This is because the meta-instincts are known to be on timed release from the genome, with active telic intentionality. As we grow older, new meta-instincts come online, and ones from previous stages of adaptation switch off, in lockstep with the internal clock that orchestrates the timed release of material from the genome. 
With each stage of life, new psychosocial anticipations are active, which direct the attention, interest and libido of the person towards meeting them. Importantly, this is not a simple on-off process. Instead, meta-instincts rehearse themselves ahead of full release. This can be seen in the play of children, and states of spontaneous imagination. Young boys will play with toy guns. Young girls will rehearse mothering and caregiving behaviour. Young people of both sexes will write, speak and play out spontaneous stories and adventures, and have imagination reveries about their crushes. All of these, and many more, are meta-instinctive rehearsals ahead of their anticipated full release later in life. These have a symbolic, or archetypal, quality to them. That is, their anticipatory substance superpositioned into them is a full, narrative-based meta-instinct. The following chapter gives some examples of meta-instincts or archetypes in action in the real world. What follows is a discussion on the platonic form of the masculine and feminine, as an example of a superpositioned meta-instinct in the real world. We've already discussed what the platonic form is, and its importance, in our Rebirth series of videos. So today, we'll focus specifically on the telic trajectory of projection of the form onto another person, through to the resultant Jungian inflation, then, when that inflation metaphorically pops, how this brings the Adlerian, Freudian and Darwinian elements to the fore. This is very often at the centre of when an otherwise presumed positive relationship begins to go wrong, and the two people involved begin to clash with one another. We'll cut now to Steve, speaking on the dynamics of a man projecting the platonic form of the feminine onto a woman. Of course, this works the other way around, too. The, the state of projection is such that it elevates the, uh, the relationship for a man uh, to a Jungian level of uh, almost worshipping the form as projected onto the woman. When that doesn't fit, and they realise they may have made an awful mistake. When that happens, the collapse, the Jungian inflation, which is metaphorically like uh, the, the eruption column of a volcano, once that the heat goes out of that and the collapse starts, it's not that they fall back down through their Adler and to their Freud. They actually descend down through those elements in the other. So once the, 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 the object of the projection, if you like, can no longer receive it, then because the attachment is still there, but the Jungian element can't do it, they, they drop down through Adler, the other person's Adler, their, their control and their need for gratification and their narcissism. And during that descent, they lose connection with themselves and they overly attach to the other in a way that means that they're controlled uh, in terms of their pa of power and also their gratification of the other becomes more important than their own life. And that's what you see. Uh, and it's that that gets um, called the negative anima in such a, cases. And it's a reasonable uh, descriptor on the surface. But what it doesn't show is just how powerful that Jungian platonic projection is uh, and therefore it doesn't give up easily. Once the feet leave the ground and the eruption column is up in the sky, the pyroclastic flow drops, but not through them, through the other, because they are still attached to them. And then you see the damage that's done on uh, during that descent, then that um, the person who is archetypally disappointed in their relationship at a Jungian level is still victim to the other's power at an Adlerian level and victim to the other's control for their gratification um as well and and then the then the, the collapse hits the ground and spreads out and just incinerates the, the poor man's life then that kind of thing can happen and leave them in a dreadful state um, and then the Jungians talk about catabasis and all stuff like that and mythopoetic um but really that person needs to be rebuilt through the meta instincts they lost uh 
any conscious relationship to to that the moment that it reached the Jungian level within themselves or the Platonic level uh, of uh, projection of the, the innate imago. So Steve spoke there on the model of the eruption column of the volcano, that when this eruption column comes back down again and forms this pyroclastic flow, it comes down again through the other persons, Freud and Adler. I was very interested, Pauline, if you had any thoughts on that model. Yes, I do. Uh, I think it's, as it just illustrates so well the, the dynamic uh, that underpins it mm. with respect to the platonic form when the platonic form once it's been projected can't uh, be sustained in the way that it was previously then it, it for me it just illustrates so well what happens psychologically between the two people involved and I, I would reverse it. I, I would think of it as as coming down through Jung, Adler, Freud in, in that direction, the the uh, column collapsing in that way through the other persons, Jung, Adler, Freud. So young men obviously want to try and understand themselves in relationship to women, but there's a tendency, it seems, for men to do that with other men. And so they try and understand women through masculine mm -hmm. psychology. Yeah. And mm -hmm. Freud and Jung did it too. Freud talked about the uh, the, rid the riddle of femininity, as he called this, I think it was in 1933, in a new series of lectures about psychoanalysis. So he was clearly having difficulty understanding women and female psychology, but he, he looked to his contemporaries, to his peers, to other men to try and understand that rather than to women themselves. And Jung was the same, Jung had the same problem in his own analytical work, uh, in the sense that, you know, it, his concept of the anima is, is really rather a narcissistic one. And what it tends to do is to encourage young men to look within themselves um, to understand outer women, which they will never do. And so that plays into the model of the um, or the analogy that we used of the uh, the pyroclastic flow as well, and the way in which uh, when the the um, projections fall away, the way in which they cascade down through the other person, the psychology of the other person, rather than necessarily the person who's who's doing the projecting. So there's there's two things there, isn't it? Because it's a relationship; it involves two people. Yes, that's the focus, anyways, at the dyadic level. And uh, the eruption column model oh. shows what happens when a man projects his anima yes. and it doesn't work. Yes. Uh, he's reached the level of the uh, the archetypal or Jungian mm. inflation within himself in order to relate to the other person. So the other person's appropriated to that internal model that they have. Mm. Um, and then when that fails yes. that, and the collapse takes place, oh. He's left groundless, but the collapse actually passes down through the power relationship it does. to the other who has some degree of control over him. So that's where Adler comes into it. Mm. And we know that Adler conceals Freud. Mm. So wherever power is being uh, expressed in a relationship, there is some level of Freudian gratification. Mm. Um, and what you're saying is obviously reminiscent of the idea that men will never understand women by looking in at their anima. Mm -hmm. What they look in at in a Jungian sense is the projection making factor as Jung understood it. Yes, that's right. So yeah. in other words, that's yeah. the illusion that, he, that they're projecting onto women. So they are oh. still narcissistically engaged with themselves. Yes. And that's why there's no ground beneath their feet when the, the Jungian inflation pops. Yeah. Uh, so they can't make sense of the experience, but the other person will, particularly if the reason for the projection had nothing to do with that person's character, but only that an image, an imago, if we're speaking in pure Jungian terms, the Jungian animal was projected onto the woman, mm. or she elicited it, mm. consciously or unconsciously. Yes. Um, but it, when it no longer fits, then we get the depressive state that, that's brought about by a collapse in archetypal projection. Yeah. But functionally, in an everyday sense, mm if the person that the man has projected onto is not of good character or motivation, then they will feel the energy of that uh, collapse from, from the guy dropping down from Jung, to use the metaphor of the pyroclastic flow, that energy transfers into her Adler, 
mm. her power over him. Mm. And you see this all the time. It's as if the man has lost something. He's lost his animating spirit. Therefore, he's lost his, uh, his capacity to be a man. And women will often turn on men when they're weak, you know, when, when they lose their masculinity. Because yeah. it's not just the projection that's lost when the, uh, the young inflation pops with respect to so-called anima projection, they actually lose their sense of identity as a man uh, and they collapse internally within themselves. But the, the energy of that shifts into supporting Ardlet in the woman very often and they will kick him while he's down mm. um, by control. And then as it drops down into Freudian gratification, it can go so far as to the woman flaunting herself with other men, flirting, and, and he's just pushed further and further down into a catabasis to use a Jungian term, but it might be one that he doesn't have the energy or the resources to recover from. Uh, and then the woman just keeps kicking him when he's down. And that's what we see very often. It's a cruel Darwinian element. And Darwin is all, always beneath Freud. Mm. The Darwinian pressure test, the shit test basically mm. then is, will you reconstitute yourself so you're worthy of me in a biological and social sense, biological Freud and Darwin, social Adler, and if the man is too depleted because he got too inflated, like you said earlier about um, Icarus flying mm. too close to the sun, he won't be able to do it. So she'll just keep rubbing his face in it and maybe the relationship uh, fails completely or she works out on him um, by, by having affairs at whatever level of engagement with other men or whoever or whatever indeed. Um, all of it is designed to control and to keep the man as a victim uh, mm. and to feed her narcissism at that point so that, that is a danger uh, and the problem is that when we mythologize this process and i'm aware that we've been using uh, allegories mm. which lend themselves to mythological um representation when we do that we drift into young in the wrong way we, we drift into young in the way that youngins themselves get embroiled in uh, and where they keep people trapped because these allegories are just representations of other forces, other factors, which is why we emphasize Arthur and Freud. So what we're dealing with fundamentally with the, the collapse of the eruption column of inflation is the dynamics, the dyadic relationship between the two parties concerned. Uh, and then we have to move away from Jung because Jung has failed at that point in the sense that Jung has provided the energy for inflation and projection. But the dynamic factors involved at this point are Adler and they are Freud and Darwin. Uh, and it's at those levels that Jungians cannot and do not and will not operate because they have rejected Freud and they have rejected Adler. They have, but Jung himself did not. Jung said, before you go near my work, you must understand firstly Freud mm. and then Adler. He made it absolutely clear. Uh, but people on the internet, you know, the internet gurus who push pseudo Jungian ideas have no connection at all with Freud and Adler. They don't understand the progression that is necessary in order to be able to reach a Jungian level. When Jung made his observations, they were partially his own and they were partially to do with how women reacted to him. And that's really important. Mm. Um, so what emerges out from that is Jung's personal myth and his personal journey that's interpreted through his own model. That's a good thing if everything follows on in the way that the Jungian model predicts, but it doesn't in real life. And Jung knew that. And Jung himself made it very, very clear that this was his model was his personal myth and his personal statement. We have to make observations ourselves. And if we're going to work with uh, Jungian ideas, we have to put them into context. So we have to understand Freud and we have to understand Adler and beyond. We have to go beyond even that. Um, so it's vitally important that the man who has uh, found himself inflated by massive genomic and instinctive forces uh, into a Jungian worship of an inappropriate woman does not mythologize that process because it is more like a volcano collapsing down in its, it, itself than it is any kind of myth from, uh, that's been appropriated from Greece or the, the Scandinavian cultures or, or whatever. The truth of it is it's energy and information. And once that collapses in a dyadic relationship, um, if the man can no longer support his inflation, then his libido is effectively transferred over to the woman and will 
go into her Adlerian social and power levels and then feed into her Freudian gratification levels. And then it will bottom out in Darwin as a massive shit test. And that's the reality basis that people need to, to grasp about this. Um, Jung describes inflation very, very well and his mythopoetic language does too. And that's one of the problems with archetypes. Whereas if you have a meta-instinctive model, which is very close at some levels of analysis, description and explanation to archetypes, but if you have that, you have more of a biological reality basis to what's going on and also understand the field relationships between men and women um, and what's driving them at an instinctive and genomic and a field level. So that's one of the distinctions between meta instincts and archetypes. Meta instincts avoid the appropriation of mythopoetic ideas generated by other people and then the internal projection of those inwardly over our own experience. If we do that, we're not understanding ourselves. We're not understanding the fundamentals of what's going on. But if you work with people, real people, and you work with a lot of them, and you work with them over decades of time and experience without projecting, say, a Jungian mythopoetic model onto them, you see what's really going on. And it's to do with energy, information, and it's to do, yes, with Jung to some extent, but also and mainly with Adler and Freud. If Adler and Freud go wrong, Jung necessarily goes wrong. If Jung goes wrong, then necessarily the pathology turns into Adler and then into Freud. It is so simple. If people can get their head around that, they're going to understand their life a lot better than if they migrate their consciousness out of reality and into mythopoetic representations. So in, in real terms, uh, and we're talking about real relationships here and, and what goes on from moment to moment, day to day in relationships of, of all kinds, that you learn more about the other person when you're vulnerable and when you're down yeah. than when you're actually both at your absolute uh, best. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, what you may feel to be your most adaptive. And that's very instructive, I think, particularly in any kind of uh, short or long term relationship, really, about the person that you're involved with or you're having a relationship with, because Essentially, I think what's drawn out in those kinds of situations, and we all go through them, we're all tested in relationships, mm. is the character yeah, of true. the other person, which is so fundamental, I, I think, to uh, the maintenance of a long-term relationship. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And there's a distinction we've made many times between personality and character. And if you go on the internet and look at the typology gurus, oh. everything's about personality type. And personality type is meaningless when measured against the fundamental of character. Mm. Uh, as we said before, you know, an INTP can be a psychopath or a saint, but they're yeah. still an INTP. Yeah. INTP does not distinguish between somebody being a saint or a psychopath. It cannot. It does not. Mm. Character is so fundamental. Yeah. You know, and when we were young, the most important thing was, mm. is someone of good character? Mm. Nobody's bothered about personality. Personality is essentially the persona of character. It's that which expresses it. It's filtered through it to some extent, but character is more fundamental. And character is, is that which is basically the essence of an individual human being. So meta instincts, brackets, archetype, close brackets, uh, will be expressed through character. They will be inextricably linked with character as well. Mm -hmm. And then there's, a, there's another distinction, which is nuanced and it's fine, but it's also obvious uh, in uh, the, the same uh, sense. That the way that a person articulates themselves with respect to their character is only partially conscious we don't necessarily know what our character is. We have to discover it on our journey through life, through our relationships to other, others. And then if we are reflexive, if our ego does its job properly, we analyze, we test ourselves and say, I didn't like myself for what I just did, or I don't like the potential that I have to do, apparently, something which contradicts my morals and my ethics. Youngians will jump on that and say it's the shadow. That's a mistake. 
because if you do that, then you generate something that does not properly exist in the form that the onions uh, talk about it. What's actually happening there is that the ego is becoming conscious of the bandwidth of potential within their own character. To become conscious of it is sufficient for the ego to do its job of adaptation to the world and, and through relationships to others. You do not have to make an apotheosis of this idea of the shadow that we've got to tackle this before we tackle anything else. And it's some evil and opposite twin. That's a neurotic mistake. It's a terrible mistake. Don't do that. The ego has to do its job. So if we are aware of the potential for a bandwidth of, uh, of character deployment into the world and into relationships, then we know that we're working homeostatically with our lifespan development. And we can say, OK, I'm a human being. Humans are capable of that, but I'm deciding I'm not going to do it. Or I didn't like that. And I'm going to do something about distilling the essence of my character out from my insight and out from my reflexive connection with my relationships to others, which is where the so-called anima and animus come into it. It's the relating function and relating system in our approach. Then we don't collapse it only into gender identities and all of their various forms. It's all about how do I relate to myself and how do I relate to others? And by myself, I don't mean my ego, but I mean my character, I mean my genome, I mean my potential for life. The construct of the shadow is a stumbling block. So is the construct of the anima or the animus. It's problematical for adaptation. And we should, if at all possible, avoid collapsing into that and just look and see how people actually relate uh, and what goes wrong. And usually the solution is fairly simple and it, it focuses around the construct of, or the concept of homeostasis, self-regulation. That will only go wrong where we include the dark triad, you know, psychopath, sociopath, narcissist. People like that, when they self-regulate, all they do is express what their character is. But we should be thankful for that because then we see what they are. And that's where the pressure test comes from. When we look in, we're not, we shouldn't be looking for a Jungian shadow or a Mr. Hyde to Dr. Jekyll. What are we? Or a Jungian anima for that matter. Or a Jungian anima, mm. or because animus. you're not, yeah. Yeah, or animus, mm. yeah. If, if a man looks in and, and, and sees the thing he's been told is in there and it's the Jungian anima, then you are not relating to women. You're, you're relating to masculine psychology yeah. as evolution has prepared you yeah. so that you project onto women enough to like them, to like them enough to want to relate to them and to reproduce with them. And this is why it's so painful when that projection does not settle and doesn't work properly. Because guess what? Suddenly you don't like women or at least a certain woman. And you might generalize that out, which means if you do generalize it out, that your relating function is not working properly. And maybe it doesn't work properly because you've read Jung or you've listened to an Internet guru and they've told you about the, the negative and destructive anima in that traditional Jungian way. You're not relating to women. You're still making the mistake. Because the anima is part of masculine psychology, every bit as much as the animus is part of feminine psychology. Mm -hmm. Neither of them relate to men or women as they really are in any contrasexual sense. And we don't have a minority of female genes and so forth, as we've yeah. said many times, and, and as you, James, as a microbiologist, mm -hmm. have pointed out many times. That just simply isn't true. These are preparations. These are meta-instinctive scenarios which are born into us to prepare us to get on with, with women and to get on with men and to reproduce, or in a non-heteronormative relationship, simply to relate, to thrive and to survive. Mm. That's still relating function. The relating function and system do not, does not discriminate no. between genders, so-called biological or otherwise, socially constructed, it does not. It's about relating for a purpose, yes. And then we can find out what that purpose is without confusing it. Um, but so many problems come about by making these things mythopoetic because you're moving another step further and further away from reality. Well, I think you have to, a number of things come to mind. I think you have to factor in what, what I was saying before about the personal myth or the, the and the models of the men who have uh, influenced us, like uh, Freud and Jung specifically. Yeah. And put that back into the context of of their own lives uh you know they they were fallible 
they, they were pioneers for sure. They were great pioneers, but they were fallible too. Uh, and they were obviously looking to un understand themselves and to understand women, but not necessarily in the best possible way. And I think some of that, uh, some of the problems that we have now today contemporaneously have, have persisted from those times because if we think about um the way in which and we've talked about this before uh feminism and the feminist movement uh has evolved over time then the, the this this the, the problem that women have with understanding themselves not only existed then for freud and young but still exists today yeah. and so young men today are still having the same kind of problems understanding women as freud and young did yeah. so in that sense we haven't moved on at all no. so there is an obligation really on women to get their act together for sure uh what they won't do is they they won't do it if they try and pull the, the bottom rung out from their understanding of what it means to be a woman and that is their biology because their biology and their psychology are, are constant they're, they're in a, almost a constant battle with one another certainly during their reproductive years mm -hmm. and it's up to women to get the balance right to understand that you'll not get the psychology right women won't get the psychology right by trying to eliminate biology or vice versa so when I think about some of the women, young women that I know who have got it wrong or have had problems in relationships, it's usually because they're not sufficiently conscious of their biology or the, the, the Darwinian push to reproduce. They're very much aware of their psychology uh, because that's something that they have to deal with day in, day out, but they don't necessarily factor in the biology no. sufficiently. So for young women going into relationships i think it's really important that they have they have a conscious relationship to that as much as they possibly can otherwise they'll be they'll be driven by the freud and their adler to seek a relationship or to secure a husband or whatever it happens to be and there won't be very much in the way of conscious understanding or intention going along with that and you know that's potentially a recipe for disaster mm -hmm. in the same way that it, that it is in reverse when women project you know the platonic form of the masculine onto an external man and that man doesn't you know fit the projection sufficiently for it to be sustained yeah uh and then they don't know how that's happened they don't know how they've got into that state so because so, you say the yes, same the same thing occurs then doesn't it yeah that if it's the woman who's projected the animus should yes. we say or, or the platonic form of the masculine yes. and it doesn't fit yeah then the energy shifts over to the man. And That's this right. is what you very often see with men who abuse women through yes, power and through do. sexual exploitation yeah. or, or all that kind of thing. Yeah. So it, it, all the energy in that dyadic relationship mm. shifts from being balanced between two people who are in a harmonic resonant field relationship. Yeah. It shifts across yeah. uh, and then the, the, the man in this instance yeah. has the power yeah. and he will probably use it and, yeah. and kick the woman literally when well, she's down well, yes. and I abuse mean, you, her. And, yeah. Yes, I mean, arguably you could say that you you mm. you give away your power to the other person to harm you in that way. Mm. Uh, and that's in part because obviously in situations like that, complexes are mobilised, parental complexes particularly are mobilised and everything becomes, you know, really quite... Um, quite complicated, really, in, yeah. in a psychodynamic sense. Yeah. So y you could also say that for some people, too, that would be the starting point. I mean, certainly traditional Jungians would think of that in an alchemical sense as being the start rather than the ending yeah. of something. But, of course, that just depends That's on a good point. the two people who are involved. Mm. Um, and... I guess whether in terms of the relationship as a whole, it's worth working to say. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a really good point, Paul. So it's possible for both eruption columns to collapse simultaneously. Yes, it is. And then what you'd find then is that the energy and information doesn't shift. It just collapses down its vertical axis for both parties. Yeah. And that's a kind of a separation. And it's only if they can go through that experience together, like mm. you say, in that, sort of a metaphorical alchemical mm. sense 
uh, that they can follow the process, you know, starting yes. within the grade or the blackening right. and so forth. Yeah. yeah. That Jung talks about in Collective Work 16. Yeah. That's possible then if there is motivation to do it. Definitely. But we have to watch um, the Jungian tendency again to mm. overly amplify yeah. that metaphor so yes. people are led through it and thinking this is exactly as it's set out in the Rosarium. Mm. Uh, medieval and, and the mm. renaissance alchemical uh, text mm. it can be allegorized in that way but it's not necessary to do that and as a professional therapist when you work with couples it can be a problem if you impose that on them mm. if you, um, it all depends on the people but we should not lead with that if it feels right for them and it feels right for mm. the field of the therapy or, mm. or the personal development if it's a couple who are working on themselves together that's absolutely fine never never impose it because there will be a reaction from within if the psyches of the the, the people concerned and that means therefore the field of relationship between them disagrees with uh, using that as an allegory or a metaphor for the process then there will be resistance and then there will be problems and one of the things that you, you'll see then is that one or both of the parties will leave either the therapy or the relationship because they don't want it to be allegorized. They don't want it to be mythologized. Um, they want things to be more practical. They want it solved now, yeah. not four, five, six, seven, eight, ten plus years down the road, which can happen with classical lineage analysis. Mm. Um so feeling is very, very important. Affect and emotion is very important. Some schools of therapy, though, think that's everything. All you have to do is feel something. Um, not integrate feeling, not get beyond feeling, to meaning. Feeling is an indicator that there is meaning which is not conscious. That's hugely important to understand. Affect understands, but is not connected to cognition. It's very, very difficult to integrate affect in a meaningful way. Meaning is another state that is only indicated by powerful affect. It is not the same thing. Meaning is that which Jung would have referred to as being a transcendent function and uh, yeah. basically brings the solution to the problem with it. But simply experiencing meaning and forcing somebody who is distressed to experience more distress is completely wrong in this kind of scenario, mm -hmm. in particular where there's a relationship uh, involved, because people don't feel feeling in the same way at the same time. Um, so if you're working with a, with a relationship and then one of them is, yeah, let's go for this alchemy stuff. And I want to I want to be really depressed. I want to feel in the grado. I want to go through that. And everyone's thinking, what the holy are you going on about yeah. what about my feelings this is all about your feelings you can see how that would go and then it becomes competitive mm. you have to reach in and find out is there ground upon which these two can stand and share the journey together before you say to them yes you you need to do alchemy you've got to do yeah, yeah young young alchemy on this and you have to read the collected works and you have to go through it it becomes a cognition it becomes an idea disconnected from affect the most powerful form of communication is intuition because intuition is independent of any representation of it. Intuition is not a thought. It is not a sensory modality representation. It is not an image. Therefore, it's not a somatic feeling. It's not an emotion. It's consciousness of something that goes way beyond what any of those individual representational systems can initially grasp. Intuition, if it's dealt with by receiving it properly takes the heat out of the eruption column and puts people firmly on their ground that's if it's related to properly if it is not though however what happens is you see an increase in drive state what the um the neuropsychoanalysts and affective neuroscientists would call seeking the seeking system goes into overdrive because intuition is present and it's pushing, but it is not representing itself in a way that, that the person or relationship can integrate. What happens then is people get more anxious and they want to leave the relationship, they want to leave therapy because they're in overdrive. Now, that's the big indication that the seeking system and therefore intuition is trying to put into representation something which is not just emotion, is not just at this stage an idea, a cognitive representation. It's not a somatic 
representation. It's not an image. Yeah, you know, images, the way Jungians go on about images to me is really funny, frankly, because an image can be just an idea. Particularly if, if someone's been reading Jung and been told about mandalas, oh, well, I'll just generate a mandala either as an image in my mind or I'll draw one and look at it. Therefore, I have an image of a mandala. You don't. You have a cognitive representation of something which is still a symbol. That is to say, it is something other and more than what appears to be the mandala. You haven't accessed a damn bloody thing. All you've done is playing like a kid at school. Now, in order not to be overwhelmed with the affect, you need to get into a state where you can receive the intuition as it chooses how it wants to represent itself. And in order to do that in a relationship, people have to be on the same wavelength. That's what the therapist should do. They should prepare the vessel. Again, I'm using the allegory of alchemy here. The alchemical vessel for the relationship should be strong enough to receive the intuition which will then mean the affect will calm down and simply point the way towards resolution. And what you typically get there is, first of all, the, me the, the meta instincts concealed behind what we call deep structure complexes. The deep structure complexes have two sides to them. The initial side reflects back what the ego believes about itself and believes about its understanding of that part of itself, which it is not, in other words, the unconscious. So if people have been influenced by Jung, the first deep structure complexes they encounter are basically Jungian theory. Now, if a Jungian encourages them to take uh, these uh, deep structure complexes as literally real or as archetypes, then progress stops. It's another reason why Jungian analysis takes forever. If, however, it, you take this attitude towards the unconscious that it has given you an image which you understand and can agree with, but that's the beginning and you are respectful towards the psyche basically by saying thank you i have received that now it would be really helpful if i could move beyond it and when i'm ready and when you know i'm ready if you could allow me to understand what the next step is simple manners like that and what often happens then is that the deep structure complex that shows its face as being jungian the anima or something like that will turn around and we'll see what's behind it and what typically is behind that is a doorway and then a gesture to enter through the door. And then you go into the true uh, depth of the psyche, which is meta instinctive. And it's not an archetypal fantasy. You're into the representation of the genome itself and its anticipation for your lifespan development. And no one should tell you what that's going to be. You have to find that out for yourself. Drop ideas of the self or the positive, negative, animal, or the animus or the shadow or all that nonsense. You'll get a surprise if you do that because you'll find out what's really in there rather than somebody's vicarious fantasies about what that should be. But it does seem that there is a practical way of approaching this and you need to be in the right frame of mind to do that. And if it's a relationship that's doing it, then there has to be some firm ground. There has to be a history between those people that say there's something worth keeping between them, despite the distress of the affect or the conflict at a cognitive level or the visceral sensory reactions they're having to the distress that they're under. And the only solution to that is going to be a gentle receptivity to meaning which will be delivered through intuition. And none of that has anything to do with the Myers-Briggs or internet gurus who abuse Jung's model of typology and don't understand it at all. These are important things to bear in mind. Well, I agree with you, Steve, in the sense that when couples turn up for therapy in that very, very acute state, uh, they're very much into their own Freud and Adler. The, the last thing on the menu is anything that might uh, have some kind of positive transcendent meaning. And so, and people get entrenched because, you know, once they they realize that they have the power to hurt the other person and and to some extent that makes them feel powerful and they get off on on that. It's hard to budge them beyond that point uh, at which they can then become receptive to the unconscious or the non-conscious in the way that you're suggesting now. So. Having said that, though, that is actually in keeping with what Jung himself says. It's entirely in keeping it's entirely with it. Entirely in yeah. keeping with it. Or you, you won't get to me and my ideas mm. until you've sorted Freud and Adler out. Yeah. And yet it seems that 
there's so many people out there who keep ignoring that piece of piece of advice and it's so fundamental yeah i mean if, if you go into young before you're ready for him you're in a place where you shouldn't be yes that's and true. he said that yeah um he thought that you had to be 35 at a minimum and uh have met the Freudian and Adlerian's obligations to the first half of life. In other words, to normal developments. Mm -hmm. As I said on Discord the other day, Plato was kinder. He, you know, he said 30 before you go anywhere near philosophy. But it's the same idea that a, a level of <clears throat> adaptations to the world, even if it's maladaptation, we're, we're all maladapted to mm -hmm. some extent. Uh, and we accrue maladaptations through the first half of life. That's normal. But we need to go through that before we're prepared. And that's not to put anybody off doing depth psychology who feels they have a calling to do it, because that would mean their own meta instincts if they have a calling are saying that I have to do this. That means that you're precocious. And with being precocious comes problems that other people don't have. Uh, other people might attempt to do this and they don't have either the calling or the capacity to do it and they will fall apart neurotically um but those who have a calling will still fall apart neurotically but they have the potential to grow beyond that and to integrate it together this is not an easy journey it's not easy at all and that's part of testing character that i mentioned earlier you ask yourself is this for me and what are my motivations if it's about personal development that's valid but if you think that you're going to be a therapist then Part of it has to be that you are going to work for the benefit of others. Uh, and if you're going to be someone who develops theories and models of practice based mm -hmm. on experience, uh, therapeutically with others, then you need to be a truth seeker. Um, and that means everything has to be tested, particularly yourself. Your own ideas have to be pressure tested and that has to be systematized in a reliable way so you don't collapse then into your own personal myth and that you have error correcting feedback built into your model which then checks you as well and and checks your development otherwise we get what we got with some of the early pioneers yeah. freud and Jung, very clearly yeah um where the whole thing collapses around them mm. uh, and their personal limitations as well as the higher level capacities mm. uh, and then if we attempt to follow them directly the best that we can do is to vicariously learn what they did in their life and therefore decontextualize ourselves completely mm. which Jung said do not do mm. um, so anybody who thinks they're a Jungian is not actually being a Jungian the only way you can be a Jungian is not to be him Jung to live by means doing it your own way it doesn't mean attempting to copy him in any sense at all. Yeah. And in order to do it your own way, you have to go right back to basics. The most fundamental things of all, you have to test yourself and your understanding. And that might begin at home within yourself, but the, the proof is always empirically through the lives of others. Yeah. Otherwise, it's not objective. You may as well be a philosopher in, in the most pejorative sense of being a narcissistic, ruminative, cognitive loop um, thinker who is divorced and a schizoid way from life. Don't do that. Don't waste your life. I think there was a necessarily an element of narcissism involved with some of the great pioneers, yeah. like, like Freud and Jung. Uh, it, it, they, they almost had to have that degree of belief in their own ideas just, just to generate them. And then, of course, you've got... you've you know you've got the added difficulty of that that, that were, they were both uh, medical doctors so you've got the persona medici and and their attachment to their own persona which to some extent tripped both men up it did, yeah. uh, it, it not only did it um give them a degree of power that most of us don't have or, or won't ever have but it was also an impediment to to them being effective clinicians in many ways yeah. and so we have to remember that as well yeah. and i think as you rightly say steve for anybody who's considering um being a therapist uh you know as a profession you have to realize first and foremost that it's not about you yeah uh, and and that you are there principally to help other people that's yeah. not that you shouldn't be you know take care of yourself or uh 
you know, take care of your own uh, psychological hygiene. It doesn't mean that at all, but it just means that that should be the emphasis because the minute you become too attached to your own persona, you're lost not only to yourself, but also to the person that you're working with. Yeah. And Freud and Jung, I think both discovered that. They did. Um, yeah. You know, to yeah. their disadvantage, really. Certainly when it came to things like hypnotherapy. Yeah. Uh, their persona absolutely got in the way of them being effective hypnotherapists. Yeah. For yeah. example. That, that is absolutely true. It wrecked it for it them. It did wreck it for them. Yeah. yeah. And therefore for the field of hypnotherapy, arguably, as well, in mm. that historical sense. It was left to others to yeah. correct for every mistake they made yeah. and some of them are not properly acknowledged such as Pierre Jeanne, yes. Milton Erickson even and yes. uh, Ernest Rossi who uh, have moved uh, between those three mm. they have moved hypnosis on so far yeah. and there's so much ignorance out there about it that still persists mm. amongst Jungians and Freudians and neuropsychoanalysts as well yeah yeah and yet that would be, for a lot of people, knowing more about hypnosis and how effective it can be would actually be the door to what you were talking about before, the, the, the door to meaning uh, and to accessing the transcendent function. And it's something that if you know what to do and there are safeguards built in, you can yeah. do it for yourself. And you don't quickly. need, and very quickly, yeah. you don't need anybody else to do that for you yeah. and to trap you clinically for years yeah. on end. Yeah. Very true. I was very interested in the instinctive consciousness model. So the unconscious not being truly unconscious, how most people model it, but having a consciousness of its own, because the inevitability, it seems, of that inflation from Freud, Ardley, Jung, popping or you know the, becoming the pyroclastic flow back down. Yeah. Uh, I was very interested in the telic trajectory that might be behind that, because it almost sounds like for a lot of men that's from the instincts point of view not from the ego obviously because it's anti-homeostatic but from the instincts point of view that's desirable which obviously is not a pleasant state of affairs but that would make sense because if, if darwin's always there and it's just the same information into freud into adler into jung that means it's the genome or certain part of the genome the whole way through so from its point of view is it trying to push for a teleology even though it might be non-homeostatic for the ego yeah and um this is really important because in order to face this we have to get away from ego-based psychoreductionism and find that there's another several uh, different layers of consciousness which are superpositioned between one another uh, and as the fundamental platonic element works itself through and, and first of all it will meet darwin um what we're actually seeing then is, is baseline adaptation and pressure testing that allows things to unfold. Without them, nothing works beyond them. If we take Plato out, the whole thing collapses. We take Darwin out, the whole thing collapses. There's no efficient cause without Darwin. By efficient cause, of course, I'm, I'm referring to Aristotle's understanding of that. that. That's the mechanism by which things seem to work. Um, so anything that's downstream of that has to include it, even if it's concealed, it's still within it. And we know that it's within it in the same sense that when we talk about the Large Hadron Collider as a metaphor, that when we collide two uh, fundamental particles together, we find there's other things in there, which are obviously necessary for those allegedly fundamental units of matter to exist. Oh, where did they come from? Well, they've been there all along, and without them, you will not have what you believed were the fundamental levels. So in that sense, then, if we are psychoreductive, we're ignoring everything that is there, and that's the field again. It's the difference between the objective waveform and the subjective waveform. Uh, and when people get neurotic, it's because the subjective waveform is out of homeostatic regulation with the objective to some scale, to some uh, relevant uh, scale. And if that being out of kilter goes all the way down to the platonic, then we can say someone's in a right mess. But at the same time, we can also reach into the platonic via meta instincts and therefore via the genome and bring about a correction, which is outside of normal ego psychology. In other words, a non-cognitive correction that is homeostatic. So that would be my first response to what you've said on that. That point, James. Sorry, Paul. You... Oh, no, I was just thinking. So, could we say that for some people, 
who find themselves in relationships or for whatever reason are unsat unsatisfactory or, or, or they fall apart, that there may have been some kind of design um, at, at a non-conscious level that actually drove them into that situation so that they could correct for something else yeah. uh, that, that is clearly maladaptive for them. So it's a, it's a kind yeah. of a way... <clears throat> Yeah, it, it's basically an opportunity to manifest the intentionality of the platonic field or not. And why would or not be adaptive? Because it gives us flexibility. Otherwise, everything would be so mechanistic. Mm -hmm. All that would ever happen would be that the fundamental uh, layer would reproduce itself directly. There wouldn't be any possibility of variation emerging and that, that's a that's a fundamental thing with darwin isn't it that the, the competition brings about the capacity to generate new forms of adaptation new forms of behavior new forms of life that kind of thing mm -hmm. so if we regard the platonic form as not being fixed but as being a starting point that has within it the capacity to change and we'd have to look for well, what would be the, the mechanism be of change. And we find it immediately if we consider Darwin. We also find it immediately if we consider Sheldrake. Uh, Rupert Sheldrake's um, notion of formative causation, morphic resonance, behavioral fields, and, uh, and so on, is intriguing, but it's collapsed. And it's separated off, for him, it seems, from a consideration of the platonic our view is that they are actually the same thing. And it's just that by the time the platonic is passed into form and then starts to manifest itself, we see this selective process underway, which we can model as being Darwinian at a certain level of analysis, description and explanation. And at another we can say is uh, Sheldrakian, but they're both efficient causes of something which in essence is a feedback loop. So that would mean then that the platonic has built within it what we can eventually say will be Darwinian uh, mechanics, Darwinian processes, but also Sheldrakian fields. It's there. And there will be a feedback across the field which extends all the way, say, from Sheldrake back down to Plato. So when this is completed, this universe of ours, in this metaphysical model that I'm suggesting here, it will mean that the platonic form that we started with has been updated to some extent. And then when that is kicked off again, this is metaphysics, I appreciate, then it will start from a new position, which will have anticipations for things which were formally morphic. And from a Sheldrakian perspective, we can say, well, maybe that's, that's what's happening now, that some of the form that takes place has happened before in a previous metaphysical modeled universe. And so the platonic form releases then Sheldrake, makes it easier for that to happen. The same with Darwin. Now, we can also bring in Penrose here. And when he talks about cyclical universes and uh, the remnants of a previous universe being present and generating this one, it's entirely congruent with that. We're just taking a slightly different level of analysis and description and saying, well, therefore, Darwin is probably here because the Darwinian processes existed before in a previous universe. The Sheldrakian processes existed before in a, a previous universe. But ultimately it's part of one field uh, and what we call Sheldrake and what we call Darwin are complementary they're not opposites they're not antagonistic the same also with Plato the whole thing will from a field sense would link up and would simply be a representation of that overall dynamic that we collapse into modeling at a certain level by the way that we describe our observation and that's congruent even with quantum mechanics the whole thing is congruent in that sense um, and I think that's a good metaphysical basis to proceed from. Then when we actually work with real people, the odd thing is that we find these things in them. We find platonic representations. We find Sheldrakian uh, field effects. And we also find, of course, the mechanistic, apparently mechanistic, Darwinian selective processes as well. The thing is, they are all there. They're all there and they're all part of the wider whole field that makes up an individual human life, and then the collective life of the species. Now, because they're all there, we can't really ignore them unless we're going to be psychoreductive. Once we get psychoreductive, we collapse into the ego. Once we collapse into the ego, we get neurotic, and then we generate ridiculous philosophies as well. 
uh, and models about experience without actually experiencing anything because the modeling process is more important than living. Uh, and that's an issue for anyone who's been trained in rationalistic Western philosophy. Uh, we have to get them away from that and they have to start to experience things along the lines that I was saying earlier. Um, and by the time you get into meta instincts, uh, and I said it will be a surprise when people do, uh, and all of the, uh, the internal projections have been stripped away, then the nature of the psyche and, and what it itself is grounded within reveals itself as it is. And that's a very strange experience. And the only way you can integrate that then is to build a model of representational psychodynamics. In other words, something that the ego can understand and integrate. And that's cognitive, but it's not the same kind of cognition that collapses into a singularity and excludes everything uh, else. It's an informed cognition that is aware of its own field nature, its embedded field nature. So is it best for people then to start with that expanded view of things, yeah. to start with a, an understanding of fields and field effects yeah. and then to collapse as is necessary or to collapse the objective waveform into uh, a subjective collapse at some point to yes. understand other elements of it. But yeah. it seems to me that you're suggesting that people, uh, if they're trying to model these ideas, to start wide and then focus yeah. if they need to, rather, yes. than the, rather than the other way around, yes. which, of course, the ego tends to prefer yes. to do. And, and in, in a depth psychological sense, I, I would uh, call upon Jung to support me in this when he said that people tend to think that they are only what they know about themselves. In other words, mm. the ego collapses into itself. It doesn't understand that there is an unconscious. And Jung clearly demonstrated that it's not unconscious. It is consciousness of a different kind. Mm. He demonstrated this empirically with his work on complexes. Everybody should read Collected Works Volume 2. They need to get their head around that and find out just how practical Jung was mm -hmm. in the early part of his career mm -hmm. and then work on the implications of that, that there are multiple uh, layers of consciousness that are different to our normal consciousness that are operating all the time. Then look at his model of synchronicity mm -hmm. and don't take it as an occult or paranormal phenomenon. Look at that as a field phenomenon. And then you understand it. Uh, and it's the same with many of his insights. Just drop, drop the mythopoetic language, get into the experience. And the thing that explains it more than anything is a field model of information. Then suddenly Jung is demystified, but you actually achieve a transcendent position very, very quickly with respect to his ideas. And then you, you won't need drugs either. You won't need that. drugs, no. Mm. You do not. You do not no. need that. That's, that's another topic for it another is time. altogether, yeah. Uh, but once you understand the field nature mm. of existence, then you can acquire information very, very quickly mm. without inflating. Yeah. Because you know that things belong properly in different places. They're all related, but they don't belong in an ego that then also inflates and paradoxically collapses into a singularity around itself. Whether that's because there's an overemphasis on being rational and cognitive or whether it's through a religious style delusion that's been borrowed vicariously from other people. And I will include some of the interpretations of Jung in that. But once we get practical about working, and you have to work with other people to get this experience, you, we have to get outside of ourselves mm. in two ways. Outside of ourselves to know that we are not only conscious in that ego sense. So we have to find out what the unconscious so-called really is. And then we have to work with other people because they are other than us in the same way that the inner world is other than the ego. Then we understand there's a field and that everything is connected and that you can communicate through field effects and you can receive information through field effects. The field effects represent themselves through symbols. Jung understood that. But we need to go further than he did by drawing in all of these other disciplines that have arisen since his time and link them together. If we only go backwards, we get fixed at the state of development that he was at, which was great for his time, but it's insufficient for today. And it will be insufficient for tomorrow. We need pioneers. We need new pioneers who can push the boundaries. But don't do it with drugs because that will just project you into an inner space, which is not real. Mm. It is dependent upon the substance. Totally agreed. 100 percent 
to use your guys's field model then I'm, I'm curious then a little bit further in the uh, specific nuances of this projection of the platonic form out and when things can go wrong with this i've known so many people across my life who seem to have been not necessarily mythologized in, in a jungian sense but are in that jungian part and you used the phrase earlier steve like worshiping a woman seen so many people be in that situation and it seems you can't talk them out of it at all and that makes sense from an instinctive consciousness model that there's something else with a consciousness of its own driving these people um for its own intended goal um but i really don't i i is there anything that can be done for people in a situation like that so that that inflation part isn't inevitable or at least any more inevitable than perhaps it needs to be for any one individual case i think there is an inevitability yeah. about it james yeah. I, break breaking that state or helping somebody to break that state can be very difficult because you could argue that it, it is analogous to being on a high i mean you know you, you hear lines in love songs for example i'm thinking of uh kate bush here the man with the child in his eyes where she she says i just did i just take a trip on my love for him she's kind of rhetorically asking herself that question and so you know people tend not to want to let go of things uh, that make them feel that good or they believe uh, that they that those things make them feel that good or they uh, that they attribute those qualities to the other person to such an extent that they, they, they believe the two things are identical that 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 person uh, you know is actually uh, bringing about that that state within them and so if they let go of them they let go of the state and so they feel trapped yeah. I think I think that's uh we, we do see that we see that over yeah. and over again but it, it's very very yeah. difficult to disabuse someone of it who's in that state that they should do that yeah. and, and that's partly because i think so many people go into relationships of all kinds in a relatively unconscious state um and so you know they're they're, they're, they're led into it in that way they don't see yeah. The pitfalls, I mean, I mean, you know, Jungians, uh, traditional Jungians would say, people like John Destian, for example, that at the start of any intimate relationship where there's all sorts of uh, projections flying around, that the similarities are maximised and the differences are minimised. And that's all part of the distortion that takes place uh, that means that we don't see the other person as they really are and so we're not really relating to them at all we're still relating to uh, yeah. a projection or uh, you know if it's not our own projection onto the other person it, it's whatever they may appear to be instantiating themselves and it's a hell of a trap it, it is a trap. Yeah. I, I, I agree and if we again you mentioned Destian well yeah. um he was for a while um he's actually rejected a lot of his he own has. work but, but, but just, just to mm. put that aside for a moment for a side for a while he was almost a kind of a gold standard for what you do um with respect to relationships in this way but uh, i think the missing bit which is unfortunately biological is this whole thing is set up to generate competition if we didn't, um, as men, and I'm speaking as a man, if we mm. didn't project the idealised platonic uh, form of the so-called animal onto women, we wouldn't compete for them. We wouldn't want to be in relationship to them. But someone who had that drive would, and they would go out and they would definitely make an attempt at least to find a, a relationship and a woman and then fulfil all of the, the, um, the upstream biological factors and uh, even the information on platonic factors behind that would all be fulfilled so we have to have a drive uh, and it's kind of bipolar if we look at it in a simplistic way that the one end it's just a drive to reproduce and there are some men who are like that there's some women who are like that and then there are some men and women who are more idealistic in that idealism sense that the platonic element is driving them that's the, the thing to the that's to the front but both serve the same goal and the same uh, purpose so not everyone experiences this platonic element in that way but where they do um it's overwhelming as overwhelming as a, a basic freudian 
drive simply to have sex, regardless of whether there's reproduction or otherwise. That can happen. So, um, so we need to be able to explain both of them. So there has to be a motivation that satisfies both. And I would say that that's fundamentally platonic. And then the role of the dice and the competition occurs at the Darwinian level. Both of them, um, the platonic and then the Darwinian, are selective pressures which fulfill the Aristotelian notion of an efficient cause of moving things forward. Because um, the more individual people exist who are conscious, the more platonic consciousness has a chance of instantiating and developing. There'll be a lot of wastage. But there is in biology. Biology is wasteful. There's an awful lot of reproduction that goes on across all species. There's a lot of wastage. And then there's a few that adapt and survive and move the species on. It, it's important to understand that that's also true. We are suggesting at the platonic level of consciousness that they are conjoined. The biological competition and reproduction is necessary to produce individuals who will have a higher level of consciousness and move that on along the lines that we said in the, the video, um, the AI one which I, I think is, is a very good video. I, I would uh, recommend people look at that to understand where this drive of, uh, for being consciousness is coming from. So in that sense, we can say that Darwin is downstream of Plato uh, as a very refined and focused, efficient cause to bring about um, platonic consciousness as that moves through the human level into perhaps artificial intelligence and beyond. So efficient causes of different kinds are driving the whole thing. Uh, and if we miss that in the sense that Destian misses it, the danger is we get wrapped up in Destian and therefore Jungian style um, mythopoetic fantasies about a process. And then we don't really understand what's driving everything. We just have fantasies. Thank you, Steve. On your guys' very specific means of uh, looking at this then, with your experience in therapy, um, obviously people who are seeking therapy with relationships, their relationships aren't going so well. So would it be fair to say that in the majority of cases, if I'm getting this this right, the platonic element that was previously projected out onto the other has been withdrawn completely on at least one side or both sides? Would that be a fair place to, to model it as a start? As you say, that, mm. that, that happens. That's just the manifestation that you see. Mm. And I know Pauline's always been really, really hot on this. And uh, I learned a lot from her the way that she was very uh, sensitive to what remains of the past of that relationship and, and what brought people together in the first place. That may have been projections, but there may well have been a hook to hang the projection on, you know, as Pauline used to say. And if that is still there, yeah. then that's something to build upon. Mm -hmm. um, I can remember in my sort of early uh, experiences of working with Pauline and in relationships, I was, I was overlooking that. Um, and I learned a great deal from, from Pauline about winding it back to the, to the fundamentals Um so it just depends really what was the can we find out what was there at the beginning because not all projections are illusions you know, it's just mm -hmm. that other things can intrude you know life intrudes stresses intrude mm -hmm. simple things like having to have a home or starting a family or work pressures or whatever all of that can intrude and when they intrude they generate other compensating pansepian drives which attempt to to compensate for the stress but also move people away from why they're together so yeah i i, I would agree hmm. with what you said yeah you, you do have to to try and look for what was what was there at the beginning yeah because that might be the way out that that might literally be like your ariadne thread you go in you find it and 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 it pulls you back out yeah. again yeah um there has to be a willingness obviously to do that um and every context every relationship is different and uh you might get agreement on one side and not on the other and someone is just hell-bent on leaving the relationship and, and that's it and it doesn't proceed any further but but where there's a a, a joint 
agreement that, that there was something there that at the very start that is worth going back to and preserving and bringing forward <clears> then yeah. that's I feel that's what we should do certainly as therapists yeah we should at least look for that the possibility or the potential for that yeah otherwise what what do we get we will we tend to get repeating patterns we tend to just people do this all the time don't they they just say well we clear the slate start again and then they run into the same set of problems just with a different person and uh, you get the repetition compulsion then that's that's a good point yeah because the repetition compulsion is freudian and it's neuropsychoanalytic it's panksepian uh, but describing it as a repetition compulsion to the extent that they do doesn't get deep enough into the solution particularly where relationships are concerned Mm -hmm. because there is no consideration of the platonic no with uh, neuropsychoanalysis or psychoanalysis or affective neuroscience that it's too downstream and too collapsed yeah uh, and sometimes sorry to interrupt no, you, but sometimes, go, but that's sometimes all people have at the very start of a relationship yeah and and this obviously uh comes back to the idea of fields and overlapping fields and and the resonance that exists between two people it, it, sometimes at the very beginning of a relationship that's all you have you have a a sense of or an in, intuition about yeah. the field of the other person yeah. and the potential that exists within that field as well yeah. and it might be all you have to go on that yeah. somehow you know that the person that you're with are more than what you're actually seeing or observing or experiencing in that moment Absolutely. and that can be enough yeah to take with you and to say I'm, I'm going to stick with this because this could open out into something really quite wonderful if yeah. I just give it time yeah that's a, that's a really good point because that's not projection that's um, a field intuitive it is, yes. understanding. Yes, yes. So that, that, that's such an important point. Thank you for raising that because, I, again, I could have overlooked it. It's simply enough that not all relationships start with projections. They can start with intuitions. Yeah. And our definition of intuition is perception of the field, mm. the wide field, as you, as you said, and mm. that brings about a certainty. Yeah, it does. Um which is different from simply projection and that's uh, transcendent there's the, the certainty is is, yeah. is that transcendent meaning yeah. that you then ascribe or attribute to the other person and you, you have a certainty somehow that that relationship is going to be okay yeah it doesn't stop problems occurring no, of not. Uh, because of all the pressures that we mentioned yeah. just before yeah but that's a, that's a surer ground, isn't it, than going oh, back sure. to uh, a projection yeah. that was never there. Yes. If you can go back to an intuition of the wholeness of that of that other person and the, the relationship yeah. you have with them, yeah. then you are you are truly going back to the platonic at, at, at that point. And then it's really down to the people concerned to sort out the potential that was latent at the beginning. Yeah. In fact, even manifest Absolutely. at the beginning. Yes, yeah. Thank you, Stephen, Pauline. I, even in there, I see a potential telic element too because bearing in mind that uh, the ego experiences all of this the ego um, has a role to play in all of this but it wouldn't be the one that decides if the projection goes out onto one person or another uh, whether or not it's going to pick up a certain intuition from one person or, or another so there's there's a consciousness behind all of this and I'm wondering then if that literally sometimes things needing to go down into that i mean so-called negredo etc all those more negative feeling tone stages associated with young and destiny if that's a necessary thing even further back from the field's perspective for further instantiation of that platonic but if it wasn't there it would be more like oh great there's a projection and things go wonderfully da, da, da. but there's then no there's no impetus then from the platonic for the platonic to be brought on further at that point if you kind of know what i mean well, yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree. And um, I hope I'd said that in probably too complicated a way. I don't hope I said it, but I think I said it in too complicated a way. But yeah, that's why the uh, the competition element is there, because that's the pressure testing. It, it kind of reciprocally and um, in a kind of a loop sense confirms the beginning. Um, and that that's that's hugely important i mean I, we've worked with couples who have have gone to the brink of destruction oh. and separation oh. and they've come back together mm. uh, and they're still together now 30 odd years later 
whereas on the surface that would never have happened and even should never have happened because of the things that went wrong for them in the relationship. But what that shows is that the platonic, if it's allowed to work itself through this process, this Darwinian pressure testing and confirming process, can uh, work through. It doesn't always happen. But for those who had something there at the beginning, uh, then often it will. So it's almost like um, this is one angle on it, and it's a rather cognitive angle, but uh, the ego is being tested then by the platonic information to see whether or not uh whatever potential that there is there in a prospective relationship let's say um should actually come about because it sounds like it's an implicit test yeah like the ego has to work for it and the people have to relate together to as you guys have said prepare that yeah. vessel between... <clears throat> well there, there are two fundamental things being tested one is the biological and the other is the transcendent the, or the platonic in any relationship both of them get tested some people cannot have children, they can't reproduce, but they, they still hit it off at the platonic level um, and at the level of consciousness and, and, and personal development and what they can do for others. They can have a worthwhile life without reproducing, but the repro reproduction has to be there, otherwise there is no instantiation of the platonic into matter, into biology. So both of them are primary drives uh, and either of them can be accepted as just one and to the exclusion of the other and still have an authentic life so people can reproduce but not be conscious particularly it, it almost doesn't matter because maybe their grandchildren will be you know it it's can just delayed. It, it's yeah. just delayed yeah. but you still need a pool of biology to instantiate plato some people manage both you know um, some manage none but that's part of the efficient cause the aristotelian test of plato as delivered via Darwin into this material existence that we have. Um, and again, if we think of this in a field sense, they're not actually separate. They're not even just complementary. They're the same thing, superpositioned. So the same drive is both biological and platonic simultaneously, but it's the same thing. But we can differentiate it using our cognitive mind into those two poles. But that's something of a distortion of the fact that it is one process. And we find the efficiency of that. Well, it seems very wasteful, of course, uh, but if that's almost not our reason to um, to question. It's the way that it's set up. It seems to be that you know there have to be a lot of people reproducing an awful lot to produce those two complementary factors. But as you say, the telic direction, where is it going? I would say it's towards an increase in consciousness along the lines of our AI and consciousness uh, video. But as subjective individuals, we have to work with our individual and our relational life through which both of those manifestations, which are really the same thing, are pushed telically, ontologically. What follows now are a series of kindly from you narrations of uh, discord posts to do with contemporary events, timestamp from last year. There's a lot going on that uh, only Jungian psychology or Jungian based psychology can appreciate at the psychological level. And of course, Jung goes beyond that. He goes beyond the mere ordinary understanding of social psychology or, or historical understanding of things. He does go into his model of collective psychology. And we are Jungian based, that's to say we are based and also inclined towards Jung rather than being purely Jungian. But the, the approach that we've, we've taken to this is commensurate with, with, with how we've looked at other things to do with the way the culture has been going over the past 40 years. So there's information in here which, if it's unpacked, will help people appreciate what's going on now outside of a reductive political understanding at either side of the political spectrum um, and hopefully see things that are emerging from the platonic and from the darwinian or through freud adler and into young where it's really the same thing they're just if you like collapsed representations of an overall field dynamic which is moving everything and 
it's of such importance really as a topic that the the three of us have been very careful really about how we've approached this um for obvious reasons i think but also it is so very very important to do with what may happen after this the, or these particular events and the, uh, that are going on at the moment that needs to be represented in such a way that it can get across and people as i say can unpack that and work on it so rather than just talk through it it's we've decided between the three of us that james should narrate these edited discord posts and um let's see how people feel about that because meta instincts in the platonic field are working their way through now at a, at a species-wide level across the entire planet uh, and darwinian forces are acting as well and they are surfacing through what appears to be politics but it's not reducible to that these are extraordinary times and they are extraordinarily dangerous but at the same time also there is the the opportunity being provided for a complete reversal of things and uh, a rebooting in direction and uh, if we don't embrace that then we're going to be victims of that process not even participants we won't be participating we'll just be moved by events that are beyond us so we do need to be conscious and aware of it this is a unique moment in time, particularly because of the way female matter instincts have become corrupted. And if we think about the way that, that women are being taken up and used uh, in the army to mm. fight now, I, I think that's that's relevant because of the way that women have, I guess, been manipulated on their own ardour, really and the way in which war has been glamorized for women too. They've been taken in at that kind of cultural level as well and been persuaded that it is something that women can do. And I think that's unique probably uh, in history, actually, that, that, that women are being utilized in that way to go and fight war, some of, some of uh, whom are actually pregnant as well yeah. and being taken up and, and used to fight so back to your point about the the darwinian forces at work it seems that it's just you know it's a, almost a free-for-all in a darwinian sense and the in the sense that women are being wasted oh, yeah. and they're, yeah. they're they're not sufficiently conscious of, of no. how they've actually contributed to finding themselves in that situation yeah. um and uh, you know so this is the corruption of meta instincts. It is the isn't corruption, it? particularly yeah. of female meta instincts. So there's yeah. the corruption of male as well. Yeah. But I think this is it's unique in history that women's uh, meta instincts have been corrupted in this way to the extent that they are being persuaded that they should sacrifice themselves just like men do and always have done. Yeah, I think that's unique about this moment so in that, time and in history. That's been a creeping dynamic. Yes, it has. Which uh, manifests itself originally yeah. in feminism. Yeah. yeah. Um, as if the the idea of it co-opted feminism, yes. corrupted feminism yes. through its various iterations. Yes. Uh, and therefore through wokeism and yep. now into this. Yes. So, and it's plain to women's narcissism because yeah. it's making it look like it's a glamorous thing to do. Even yeah. the selfies that they're taking of themselves and their uniforms and things like that. Yeah. It's like you can be, you know, beautiful and glamorous and so on, and you can still go to warm fat yeah. like a man. And that's a that's a that's a terrible yeah. suggestion, really. And this is both in the East, East Europe, yes. and also in the Levant, isn't it? We, yeah. We've seen evidence of that in, have, yeah. in both. So I guess what we're trying to highlight is oh. the malignancy which is hidden. Oh, yeah. That, that's concealed. Uh, and that's what we mean by the corrupted meta yes. instinct. Yes. Yeah. So that will, um, that, that's been there for a while. And it's pure Darwin. Mm. Um, and the collapse of particularly the West. Mm. We're not seeing it anywhere else, actually. Mm. You know, if you look at China, uh, they have their own problems with population, but they are not attacking themselves so fundamentally no. as the West are over such things as, you know, yes. yeah. what it means to be a particular, yeah. you know, kind of human being well, yeah. with relevance to another. That's not how it's wherever Western culture has it taken is. root. Yeah. Also, the corruption of that has taken root as well. There's some organising force mm. which is driving that, and we can only make sense of that at a Darwinian level, which means we have to include that which is upstream of it 
which is platonic. There's something about the platonic itself which is decided uh, and therefore manifested itself downstream of that, that certain things need to be pressure tested and corrected for, and it then surfaces yeah. in a political and a cultural way. Yeah. Um, but does it in this highly destructive fashion? Um, interesting. It, it's a runaway catabolism. Uh, that doesn't serve the genome particularly, except it will clean house. Yeah. Uh, and in the same sense, it will also eliminate the wrong kind of thinking, the wrong kind of consciousness as well, because the people who manifest that kind of thing will be deleted from the gene pool. Yeah. So you can see that the platonic has an interest in, in, in supporting the expression of itself through Darwin into what we're, we're seeing at a geopolitical level. But that's the wrong place to start with this. Yeah. All of that is downstream of mm. the fundamental mm. uh, deciding factors that are at work yeah. and we can also see sheldrakian effects as well breaking out and uh, the reversal of this process will probably appear as a sheldrakian field effect as we said before there are signs that that's happening uh, that uh, an enantiodromia could occur at the last moment as we've discussed yeah. in the terminal lucidity yeah. and reverse series of our our videos uh but as we've we've been saying for probably four years now, nearly on this channel, we predicted it would go absolutely insane just before the, the moments of greatest danger. Uh, and we made a prediction about when that would happen politically in, in relationship to a, a certain country. That certainly, certainly happened. And it's not because we have any kind of paranormal uh, abilities or, or anything like that. It's simply understanding by developing Jungian ideas, understanding what collective psychology is and the fact that it's yeah. it's collective psychology is embedded within collective biology, which itself is embedded within a platonic field that has its own intentionality. And as we said earlier in, in the video that the Plato and Darwin combine together. Now, um, Darwin conceals Plato, but Plato is the the only way, the only way to, to, to square that and, and to bring that through is what we metaphorically call the soul and say the soul transcends both. That idea of soul is akin, in our view, to a transcendent, a transpersonal level of consciousness that moves the platonic on. But if there's resistance to that from within biology, then the platonic will organise the biology to turn on itself. Mm. And that's what's happening. Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a sickness that we have to specifically ascribe to the West. Yeah. Because it's what's happening is, is not happening in the way that it's happening here in the rest of the world. No. And it's, it's taking, like you say, it's taking these forces that are upstream of everything else that we're looking at, you know, the Darwinian forces, to try and overturn that because it's become, well, Wokeism basically has become so entrenched and so enmeshed in the West that there's probably nothing else of, of equal or opposite strength that could actually shift it mm. or overturn it. And sadly, it, it seems that it, it's, <sighs> it's come to the point that it's, went, we're that it's meant we're happy to sacrifice our women and some of our most vulnerable people in society, or even like learning disabled people yeah, they've been in war. The army yeah, they the, are. Yeah, so the, it just shows how far we've gone down that path, unfortunately. Yeah, they're being uh, taken off the streets and put into the armed forces and they're dying. They're not competent cognitively and they're not competent physically, but the, you know, the information on this is available. You can get it from okay. within the country concerned. Yeah. And there are signs that the country concerned itself is beginning to move towards a position of civil war, which is, if you like, the political and biological manifestation of an enantiodromia, but pushed to an extreme. Um, these are easily understandable collective psychodynamics. It's not a difficult thing to understand, particularly if we, we put biology into the equation. The difficulty will be in putting Plato into the equation and understanding that biology is not blind, it is being directed itself. Um, and if we can find out why uh, that is happening, then we can really get ahead of this, this process and, and bring it to an end um, in a productive way rather than a damaging or destructive one. But the people who are in the way, you know, um, they're going to hang on to the very bitter end. Mm.
because of the Freud Adler Young equation. Yeah. On truly understanding our contemporary events. In a YouTube video posted by a prominent political commentator, the case is laid out that there is no answer to the problem in the Middle East. Neither side will speak with each other, each having their own interpretation of what's going on, and therein lies the core of the problem. In response to this, Steve writes on the 10th of October 2023, quote, This interpretive problem is the total failure to address the field that superpositions itself into collapsed political and religious, including any sense of higher meaning, representations. The dynamic the commentator needs to address, that which even biologists and anthropologists seem to ignore, is the fundamental nature of being human, set within a Darwinian context. The Freud-Adler-Jung equation is an applicable Occam's razor to explain what's going on on the surface. The Freudian element powers everything. It becomes concealed at the level of Adler, and then when it elevates into an ideological, so Jungian religious, level of inflationary justification, the equation reverses, back down through the Adlerian, or political, and back into fundamental Freudian and Darwinian drives for gratification and survival, competitively. However, this Occam's cut is only the first. What must be more deeply appreciated is the depth psychological underpinning, first understood by Jung, about the nature of the collective psyche. Note his observations on Wotan, and the collective forces manifesting as various forms of totalitarianism in the psyche from the late 1930s and through the early 1960s. However, with yet another pass of William of Ockham's razor, we get to the truth Jung avoided, that the collective psyche is just a superpositioning of the collective genome and its fields. The unus mundus he conceived of, through his predecessor's earlier work, is real. This superpositioned field has its own dynamics, which, although psychoid in Jung's understanding, that is, not psychological and so not accessible to ego-consciousness, does in fact represent itself, indirectly, through representational psychodynamics. Jung's archetypal image, the representation in the psyche and culture, was not the archetype in itself for Jung. That unfortunate ego-reductionism, a psychological reductionism, that collapses into the ego, was a limit that Jung found very difficult to exceed. In fact, information passes through various states of representational collapse all the time. The psychoid boundary is a fallacy. The clearest example is in superpositioning, that phenomenon of simultaneous informational representation in many concurrent and contiguous states, regardless of the ego's awareness, or otherwise, of this wider field of information. Psychobiology, as per Rossi, has demonstrated transduction pathways for information in simultaneous and contiguous states within the human body. The phenomenon of hysteria and psychosomatic medicine, likewise. But information is not only manifest within the individual, it is biopsychosocial and indeed beyond even that, both at higher levels of register and below. So, unus mundus. We should not be surprised then to find that Jung's archetypal image versus archetype in itself dichotomy is as false as any other. The image is the archetype in collapsed representational form. The ego must learn how to use images to access further and deeper representations of consciousness beyond the subjective ego psychology of immediate self-referent identity and immediate experience. One of the first steps is to disidentify with downstream psychosocial and cultural representations, as these are collective collapsed states, and then 
work progressively to receive the natural representations that appear from within, that is, from other than, from within the ego, its complexes and internal projections. These upstream representations are dialectical portals to an increased consciousness. We find them in ourselves, but confirm them under natural conditions in the psyche of others. Hence, some kind of depth psychological work, including depth psychotherapy, is essential. Alternatively, a deep, resonant and engaged process of creativity in all of its forms, but narrative literature of an original kind has particular efficacy in this. The causes behind the surface structure complexity that confounds the commentator in the video are to be found at the most elementary levels of organisation of telic intentional information, that is, of consciousness, given the premise that information is the fundamental thing, so informational monism, of the universe. The ontology of the present situation is then laid bare, onward and upward in its complexity from platonic field through Darwin and thence into Freud, Adler and Jung. This indicates, or represents, the answer to the commentator's dilemma. Superpositioning is the key to understanding the unus mundus of Jung, and the intelligence directing our contemporary events. On reversing the danger of our contemporary events, Steve writes on the 28th of October 2023, quote, It is important not to contribute negatively to the field of contemporary events, but we can hardly escape their effects by remaining disconnected from observation. As the intensity of collective psychological forces increases, psychology as such becomes a mere persona for decisive determinants that remain paradoxically hidden whilst directing everything. We have suggested that the genome and its associated fields have a sentience, otherwise than the psychological unconscious that preoccupies mainstream Jungians. Jung interpreted these determinants psychologically as archetypes. That is certainly a representational psychodynamic, but it is problematic in a number of ways. The level of archetypal inflation and possession that Jung warned of is already way downstream of its cause. An equivalent would be to look at dream symbols, without understanding their origins. The dream narrative, which is the ground to the figure of the dream symbols, is at a deeper and fuller level of representation, but even this is still a symbolic or representational process, and is neither the producer or director of the dream. Complexes do not author dreams, as Jung believed that they did. Complexes, including the self-concept and dream ego of the dreamer, are drawn into the dream narrative by much deeper processes, the true writer, producer and director of the dream. Jung would have regarded this as the self-archetype, which is a psychologism, a collapse of psychosocial, psychological, biological material and informational field factors into an ego-psychologized representation. Just another symbol that mirrors the ego back to itself, albeit in exaggerated form. Jung's emphasis was psychological, what was experienceable to the reflexive ego. This was a limitation and a boundary that he was fully aware of, but it collapsed his epistemology and generated boundaries to knowledge and experience that do not actually exist. If Jung's self-archetype is anything, it is the genomic self, as the genome is that which can and does deliver on everything that Jung attributed to his archetypal construct, but without being reduced to a psychologism. Nevertheless, the genome as biological is not the whole story. It is innovated by and interacts with fields of information that are material, Sheldrakean, platonic, and conscious, in ways that transcend the phenomenology of human ego-consciousness with its collapsed limitations. 
the understanding of consciousness and of information as being fundamental to it has gone much further than in Jung's time. The vast majority of Jungians, if they are engaged at all with contemporary events, are still limited by the inertia of his original ideas, or the penetration of their professional psychological culture by wokeism in its various forms. Jung's archetypal hypothesis is part of the problem. It is seductive and indeed inductive, drawing attention and reflexivity into the unconscious fascination of mythopoetic representations. Trite and superficial comments are made about reified characters as archetypes, which due to their suggestive effect draw people into unconsciousness, rather than an increased state of reflexivity and engagement with the challenge of our times. The genome is pressure-testing humanity, again. Immense Darwinian selective pressures are orchestrating, themselves directed by deeper Platonic and Sheldrakian field effects. These surface as massive collective instinctive pressure, concealed by archetypal representations that fuel downstream conscious justification for the impersonal forces that are directing everything. If a tipping point into catabolism comes, it will be because the genome and its fields agree that a mass culling event should occur, with an adaptive reset to follow. Psychology, as people understand it, will go along with this because it, the personal level of reflexive psychological awareness, is the downstream effect of the determining cause. Consider the freud adler jung equation and how this plays out. By the time the Jung term in the equation is collectively activated, negatively, in this context then disaster is inevitable. Watch the politicians, their debased Freud, their instincts, and corrupted power drive, or Adler, are inflating out of control into religious justification, so Jung. Various political leaders are already using religious representational symbols that suggest that the genome is prepared to push things to the limit point of pressure testing, the fitness of the human species. Perhaps even globally. The various kinds of resistance emerging around the world are examples of homeostatic attempts at balance. They too will be caught up in the freud adler jung equation, but that is part of the Darwinian pressure test. Collapse is not inevitable. Consciousness is a field phenomenon. The more people who become aware of an extended mind of consciousness, as an example of a Sheldrakian field dynamic, the more likely it is that collapse will be averted. Be as conscious as you can. See as deeply as possible into contemporary events. Live authentically. Hold to your values. You will, each of you, contribute to the very best chance of a field reversal away from disaster. On Armageddon. Steve writes on the 27th of November, 2023, quote, IPSA students will know from seminars concerning contemporary events in the Levant that the IPSA model predicts that the political trajectory for the dominant local power is headed towards, quote-unquote, Armageddon, as a mythic finalism along the same deep structure-driven genomic lines that mythologised the events in Europe between 1933 and 1945, in that case as Gotterdammerung and End of Times, Twilight of the Gods. The respective cultures and their specific and precise mythic representational forms disguise rather than reveal the motivational dynamic common in both cases. The video that has just been shared on Discord features a former British diplomat and ex-MI6 agent who has decades of experience in the Levant, describing the Armageddon strategy being employed by the dominant local power. 
He also describes the organic response occurring between the various oppositional states worldwide, which IPSA people will be familiar with as a superpositioned field effect beneath, as the man in the video says, the religious appearance on the surface. However, Armageddon is not part of the religious doctrine of the dominant state in question. Armageddon is Christian from the book of Revelations. There are specific religious and cultural equivalents for the dominant power in question, but this is the strategized form now used overtly by name by the power in question. Yet, as a representational organizing surface structure, it has, it seems, become an official ideological strategy. There's a lot to reflect upon here regarding collective informational dynamics and just what is really driving this and related contemporary events. On archetypes and meta instincts in our contemporary events. Steve writes on the 10th of December 2023, quote, the regime of the dominant political power in the Levant has signalled that it will go all the way to a nuclear first use against its enemies. Note again the biblical references made by the regime, calling their AI intelligence program for targeting terrorists and others gospel, once more referring to the Armageddon strategy and the foreign minister of the dominant political power in the Levant referring to the mark of Cain against the UN Secretary-General. The use of this kind of language is mythic and archetypal in the Jungian sense, and is shifted in its emphasis away from the supposed religious or mythic context of that political entity, and towards a very large and influential demographic within the United States so fundamentalist Christianity. The Mark of Cain can be interpreted in many ways. Indeed, each of the three dominant faiths in the region have a different emphasis on the Cain story, even within their respective beliefs, as much as between them. All three can therefore be reached through the manipulative and pejorative use of its representational psychodynamics, an economical deployment of influence and suggestion. However, this does not mean that the regime of the dominant political power in the Levant are fully conscious of the forces motivating them. Inflation always leaves its calling card, but is ignored by the personal ego at the individual level and distributed by dilution of reflexivity at that of the collective. Therefore, the Freud-Adler-Jung equation still applies, but is hidden in plain sight. For example, there are several prominent political commentators who misquote the 18th century Prussian military strategist Karl von Clausewitz as saying, war is an extension of politics by other means. The misquote is contextually unimportant, as it's now so widely used by so many for many decades that its message is in effect a meme. Taken literally, war, that is Freud and Darwin, would be an extension of politics, Adler, suggesting that Freud and Darwin follows or is a posteriori to politics, the will to power. To understand this error, consider that a Jungian level of inflation collapses down through Adler and into its true wellspring, Freud and Darwin. If consciousness settles at the level of Adler, which is now concealing Jung, then that which is downstream of it, so Jung, and upstream of it, Freud and Darwin, are mere instruments of the actualization of power. However, we know from the Freud-Adler-Jung equation that Freud seeks Adler, Adler conceals Freud, Jung inflates and falls victim to both. The Jungian collective inflation into archetypes and religios mythopoetic symbolism is the superpositioning of the telic intentionality of the genome via its instincts. Jung's construct of the self-archetype was a psychologism, that is, a model of the representational psychodynamic, more specifically the imago, of the genome, as experienced by the individual ego, as both collective 
and transcendent. So we can say that the freud adler jung equation is a superpositioned representation of telic factors, that if not properly regulated homeostatically at the individual or collective field level, necessarily undergo Darwinian selection pressure, field dynamics, that can bring about catastrophic changes in civilizations, or indeed to the whole species-wide genome. This collective genomic shit test involves Adler as the efficient or intermediate Aristotelian cause, between the formal cause of the genome and its underlying conscious informational fields, and the final or telic cause of natural selection, understood by this self-same consciousness. The politicians are mere agents of immense powers beyond their understanding. They are compelled by natural selection to act out telic finality, with themselves being used up in the process. This is particularly marked in our contemporary events. The leader of the regime cannot let go of the tiger's tail. If he does, he's doomed, and he knows it. If he can threaten Armageddon, and indeed be prepared to deliver upon it, he may buy time to make enough global enemies for his own people to believe that only he can save them from destruction. This was the trajectory of the Central European power in the period 1933 to 1945. Its leader was messianic and entrapped his people into having to fulfil his version of Armageddon as Gotterdammerung. The very same deep structured dynamics are at work here. They are independent entirely of ethnicity, culture or religion. They are fundamental to human nature and the forces that direct it. This is why Jung's self-archetype is bipolar, divided equally between light and dark, and therefore transcendent of both. It was Jung's intuition, like Plato's before him, of an eternal truth. Jung, however, fell into the limitations of his own personality, in that by intuiting representations that he called archetypes, he completely misunderstood the power of instincts as the emissary of their master, the genome. The impression of archetypes being active in contemporary events is an illusion and a fantasy. The only decisive power present at the collective and individual level is that of the platonic field, and how this is represented in the genome and its meta-instincts. Post-traumatic stress disorder, then, is a modern term, along with complex post-traumatic stress disorder for something which has always happened. Because it's always happened, then there will be a representation of that and of its meaning and of its resolution represented within the genome and its associated fields. That's the last place that most psychoreductive therapists or psychiatrists even will look. Um, so the solution then will be at that level. Now, the closest analog to that would be Jungians, the better ones. Um, they're Harry Wilmer, mm. uh, the late Harry Wilmer, yeah. who worked a lot with Vietnam uh, veterans yeah. uh, and with what they went through in America. And um, he was very, very attuned to the sense of meaning to do with what people went through. Um, our trauma obviously can be anything which, which uh, disturbs homeostasis and splits the psyche so it partitions into an element which attempts to compensate for the trauma and of course that's a complex or it's a Pierre Janet subnuclear of, of consciousness which can distribute itself out into somatic um, issues, psychosocial issues and it gets very complex, it gets very complicated but fundamentally the way that the, uh, I'll call it the psyche, but by psyche I also mean biology and I also mean field of information. The way that the psyche prefers, it seems, to deal with this is the way that it's always dealt with it. In other words, the psyche has prepared people to go through stressful things and to go through repair and restoration of homeostasis after they've gone through it. The culture we have at the moment, though, separates people from the healing experience so basically what i'm saying is if we if we look at 
what maturational development does, then we'll uncover the healing process. And what maturational development does for all of us is prepare us for life. And that preparation comes through play as children, where we rehearse things that we have never experienced yet. Uh, and we may never experience actually, but we're, we're driven to rehearse scenarios. This is why boys collectively act out war and they act out collaboration. They act out tribal affiliations. They even act out um, personal sacrifice as well. You see young boys playing war games, you know, wherever that, that war game might be, wherever it's set, wherever it's as it used to be when we were young cowboys and Indians or World War One or World War Two or whatever. You, you will often see the representation of self-sacrifice within a group of boys playing war games which says i am prepared to sacrifice myself for you and on that basis you will confirm and acknowledge me and i will reciprocally confirm you and we'll form our hierarchy and our tribal group and we all understand and feel what that means we've never been near a war no, never fired a gun. We have no idea what it's like to see somebody die or anything like that, but we are compelled to act this out and rehearse it. So the psyche is preparing meta instincts for traumas and for adaptations. And the way that it does it is to bond a group together with a group identity and a sense of purpose, which is ancestral. It, it's, in other words, coded within the genome. It's within the Sheldrakean morphic resonance and behavioral fields that we all inherit. It's also within the platonic too. As we've discussed before today, that, that the Plato informs um, biology, informs Darwin, also informs Sheldrake, and together they're basically the same thing. It's just that we collapse into one or the other of these by the way that we look at the whole field of interaction and its teleology. So when it comes to um, military uh, veterans, and I've worked with a few, and I've actually suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder myself. I've actually been there, I've been where I've nearly been, uh, been killed in my uh, former occupation, uh, and I had to make some kind of sense of meaning because the, the division in me was between the fact that um, it was a police situation and it had to do with a riot and it had to do with a vehicle that, that was hit. And I was in and I was hit in the head with a huge lump of concrete. Somebody was trying their best to kill me, you know, basically, uh, and a vehicle on fire and being trapped in that. It wasn't so much what I was doing as where I was doing it, which was on the, the streets of my home city, where the population of that city was seen or put in a position where they felt they had to do what they did. And I was in a position where I had to act out a duty that I felt unsure about whether I should be doing it, because in my view, a police force should never be the enemy of its, of its population. And yet they were trying to kill me. Uh, that created a, a split at a, a meta instinctive level, because if it had been a war, I'd have understood it more. I'd have understood what they were doing and I'd have understood what my peer group were doing in trying to stop them and prevent them and get violent back with them. Uh, but there was a division, a split in me, which meant that um, I cannot square this because I, I see no reason to be violent towards our own people. I'm not in an invading army and I'm not in an army defending our territory. These, these are our people, our tribe. Doesn't matter that some of them were from different ethnicities, which they were, uh, different cultural backgrounds. They were our people. They were my home city. And my view was is that the police should be there to protect everyone without fear or favour. And they were attacking us. And I thought, I don't want to be here, not because I'm afraid of anything particularly, because I've faced a, a lot of dangerous situations in my career. It was the neurotic split between the meaning that I could uh, of being there as a uniformed police officer uh, and of the people who I respected and wanted to protect trying to kill me. I had no way of making apparent sense of that. Now, I, I found this in my work with military veterans, that it is similar, but not always the same. With them, you very often get um, men who have survived and uh, their oppos, their, 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 their colleagues, their close colleagues and friends didn't. The bullet hit them or the explosion hit them and... and they, they, they didn't get it. They didn't buy it, but they should have done. And their training, their military training, suggested that they, they should leave no man behind, that they should sacrifice themselves. And back before that, playing as a child, their genome had prepared them to make a sacrifice that didn't happen. They survived. 
their friends didn't. And death is the end and it's complete. People don't get up again, but they do when the children and when they play, they get up again and they're confirmed. They said, oh, yeah, you took the bullet for me. Great. You're a hero. You died and I didn't. But we can't do that. So the rehearsal and the reality didn't match. So there was a break in continuity between rehearsal and, rea and reality. The meta instinct of rehearsal as a child didn't go far enough. It didn't move into the adult phase and then be deployed, even though these soldiers had had the training uh, as the military, because there was a split between the rehearsal and reality. Now, in a warrior culture from past times, there wouldn't be such a hard break between rehearsal and reality. Uh, Spartan children, boys, were trained from the age of seven and they were tough. They were, they were really trained to be tough and to sacrifice themselves. Some of the stories that have been passed down, not just by the Spartans, but by the Athenians and others, their enemies, basically, but describe how hard that, uh, that regimen was, that some of those children uh, would die or be killed rather than fail. Uh, but that produced a very, very tough, with no hard break, between the meta instinctive rehearsal and the reality of what they, ha they had to face. <clears throat> it's similar, it's been similar anyway, in other um, warrior cultures. Uh, maybe not quite as extreme as the Spartans, who did verge on being what we would recognise as being very, very far right, ultra right. You know? um, and it, it, in the end, it was unsustainable for them. Uh, they couldn't maintain their population and so forth. So all sorts of other compensatory factors came in and regulated the Spartans down and, and their society collapsed and they lost their premier position. This is true for a lot of warrior elites. But in our culture, we have still the meta instincts and then we have reality. And when there's a break between the two, that's a similarity, albeit superficial, perhaps, of what I went through, uh, where there was a mismatch uh, and say what somebody in the military might go through and there's a mismatch. Now, if we move into a clinical setting where somebody may have been sexually abused, then there's a clash of meta instincts like the father shouldn't do this to the daughter or the uncle shouldn't do it to the nephew or wherever it might be, because the meta instinctive expectation is that these are caregivers and the person can't square that. So the, the developing understanding of psychosocial situations is compromised and there's no way to make sense of it. So there's, there's, there's three examples. There are so many more at, at so many interactive levels. <clears throat> it seems that the solution, though, is similar. And that is to go back in an affective or feeling uh, way first not to be re-traumatized, but to follow the carrier wave of affect back to the meta instinct where the mismatch occurred. Now, if you can prepare a person to do that so that they go on that journey and they go back into themselves and find the meta instinct and be healed at that level by relating to that, they can bring forward the intentionality from the genome and its field, from the Sheldrakian field, as well as the platonic right through into themselves and they can transcend the trauma and move on this is not an easy thing to do and most people need help in doing that uh, but it is possible otherwise people are left with the trauma literally which is a, a split between anticipation and what actually happens and the mismatch between that is that which cleaves them in, into this 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 terrible state of suffering now, the, the meta instinct will bring about what the Jungians refer to as being the transcendent function or the transcendent position between the opposites which have been divided. Um, but rather than it being some kind of cognitive idea or a symbol uh, or even something which just involves abreaction, uh, which the, the early Freudians would have looked at, the, the cathartic method, we need, if possible, to avoid that. Um, so they don't become re-traumatized each time they're asked to consider what has happened to them. They need to go back to a place which is completely safe, and that is the genome. In other words, the non-ego. The ego is that which has been assaulted and been divided, been split. We need to get outside of the ego, and we need to get beyond, as I say, this idea that you need to be re-traumatized. So the affect then that you feel is healing and not traumatic. And then we draw that out of the meta instinct and we bring it through the different qualia of consciousness. So the person experiences it partitioned and safe and integrated 
So the meta instincts then leapfrog over the trauma and bring the person up to date and then carry them forward into the future. Because the thing about um, PTSD, as it's now called, or any trauma, is that it wants you through the repetition compulsion to go back and to re-experience it, but it's misfired. It goes into a loop. That loop starts as cognition because it's it's thinking, but then it becomes an affective loop because when you go back into through cognition into the experience, you feel awful and you start to cathart, uh, uh, pardon the expression, abreact, discharge of emotion, which will have a, a quantum of relief associated to it, but at the same time, it's paradoxically re-traumatizing. So the person then stuck in a cognitive and affective um, uh, reimagining and re-experiencing, it's actually virtual because you're not there, you're not in that situation again, of an experience from the past. That's completely misfired. We need to get beyond that and we need to get into the healing scenario so the ego can feel connected to the meta instinct and the intention of moving forward, of surviving, of passing through something. So the soldier then who didn't die but his mate did doesn't have to feel guilt, inappropriate guilt about surviving, but can move forward and say there are other aspects of your life and your genome that need to be brought forward. So in that sense, your latent potential for giving to others, for receiving from others, from living a full life, that needs to be brought forward. You've passed through that, but there are other meta instincts that anticipate the rest of your life. You don't have to be caught in that ruminant uh, loop and trap. Similar thing for what I went through, and there are plenty of other things, and similar thing too for people who have um, gone through sexual trauma and abuse or whatever it might happen to be. We have to avoid the cognitive trap and we have to avoid the, um, the abreactive and cathartic trap of simply being re-traumatized by experiencing emotion because uh, it just fills up again. It's like a, a kettle that boils and it boils till it's dry and then someone puts more water and applies the heat and it boils again. That, that's no use at all. <clears throat> abreactive um, experiences, as I say, can feel a quantum of relief in the moment. But all we're doing is making more of an association to the trauma so it's more easily accessed again. That should be avoided. We should go for the transcendent. And the transcendent lies in the field of meta instincts that can take us beyond it. You can't change the past, can you? Um, no. I know it might sound a very sort of trite, uh, an ordinary thing to say, but you can't. And I think anyone who's, who's either directly experienced something traumatic themselves or uh you know they've uh, maybe a family member has and obviously they've they've uh, shared that experience um albeit um simply by being associated to that person nonetheless they've, they've still been through a trauma of some kind or almost by proxy on behalf of that other person I think the first thing that you really do have to get to grips with is that you cannot change the fact of what has happened and that that plays to what you said Steve about the importance of getting uh, to of going back and getting beyond the fact of the trauma whatever yeah. form or shape that's taken uh, and bringing uh, the meta instincts forward almost leapfrogging yeah. the trauma in a way yeah. and we've seen that in our own lives we've also seen it in the lives of uh, people that we've worked with where there's been um say uh, sexual abuse of, of some kind you cannot change the fact no. of the sexual abuse unfortunately yeah and you know i can think of other examples as, as well that might be more relevant to women than say to men necessarily but the, the bottom line is that's to, to, particularly if you're a therapist and you keep taking that person back and you keep re-exposing them to the trauma they'll never move on it's um it, it it's so, it's so basic yeah. but it's such a difficult thing to get across sometimes to people that mm. it will not help them doing that and like I say we know that because we've experienced that kind of thing directly in our own family mm. and it is an, it is the worst trap of all to think that if only somehow you could get back into the the, the trauma and understand it from a different perspective or angle or go through it again that it will work itself through but it doesn't yeah 
and um, getting that straight, I think, in your mind is really That's a important. really good point, Paul, because that act of going back and uh, rehearsing and thinking about alternatives yeah. <clears throat> basically defines how complexes associate yes. material to them. Yes. So it becomes ruminative. It does. Yes. And also generative yes. of more rumination mm. and more association. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, then it gradually mm. fills up the, the person's ego. And their it ego does. is supposed to be reality orientated, yeah. Yeah. not a, a virtual recapitulation yes. and generation of things that didn't happen as mm. alternatives that gets associated to it. That's so true. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I could, uh, mm. for example, uh, if I could give a personal example, it might just help other people. When, when we reached, uh, when we had our daughter, um, I, you know, it took a while for us to realise that she was learning disabled, for example. Mm. Um, and there was a point at which I, I had to accept that no matter how many times I went back over the process, for example, of, of, of giving birth, of, of having her and giving life to her, that I could change those events <clears throat> in any way. And moreover, they may not have had anything to do with the outcome anyway. Mm. But, you know, for a time, I, and I think it's understandable, women do this all the time to themselves. They get into a loop in which they blame themselves and, and they say, if only I'd done that differently or that differently or something else had, uh, had happened to, to change the outcome, it would have been all right. And then they're stuck in that loop yeah. and they can't get beyond it. And, uh, it, it you know, if, it, if it's a mother we're talking about, it doesn't help the mother and it doesn't help the child, what, whatever um, their kind of um, state of development is to move on or develop on so all these things are traps aren't they yeah. and um the the traps too for for anyone who's going for th for therapy quite frankly um uh, because if the approach of the therapist is such that it keeps mm. taking you back and making you reassociate and yeah. recycle yeah. something that you absolutely cannot change you will be stuck there yeah. and for a very long time yeah so that, that's something really, I think, important to flag up. That's, a, that's great. And also, of course, that if you go to a rational based therapist like CBT, that won't help either because yeah. that's like the negation of the affect, which mm. sets up a polarity, which causes the affect to undermine the cognition. Whereas if you go into the meta instincts, mm. you're in the transcendent yeah. position uh, and you bypass both. You do. In a healing way. Yes. It's not a, a case of using rationalism to suppress emotion mm -hmm. or emotion to relieve irrational thoughts. Yeah. You go to the transcendent. Now, Jung would have understood that absolutely mm -hmm. uh, and the importance of doing it. Mm. And that, he was right. He was that. absolutely right on that. Yeah. yeah. This chapter is all about the ego. You might, and quite rightly, be wondering why. Well, throughout formal education, most of us are almost exclusively taught to treat everything like an idea, something to study in a purely intellectual sense. Anyone who works in a specialised trade or craft knows how much this approach pales in comparison to real practical experience, something which takes its own time. Of course, this is absolutely the case with depth psychology. Even more so than this, however, right from the very start, is the fact that the psyche is a real, living phenomenon. Communicating with it is always dialectical, both ways, in real time. It's just as alive, albeit in its own way, as we are. Anyone can do it, and very quickly too, but it requires its own living set of tools. Truly relating. To relate, we need a place to stand, with our feet firmly on the ground. That is our ego. Naturally, everyone is very interested to learn about the so-called unconscious, but we can't do anything practical with that unless we know where we, as individual personalities, begin and end. To get our ego boundaries right, and to relate to the unconscious with the right etiquette and respect, is the vast majority of the work for contacting meta-instincts already done. It should be a very natural process. Unfortunately, most of the time, it's the ego which gets in its own way. 
Steve and Pauline are about to explain just how simple reality can be. How do we contact meta instincts? And how is that different from contacting archetypes? Well, obviously, we've already discussed the similarities and differences between the two. But the real practical difference is derived from shedding all of the theory, all of the theory constructs and engaging naturally with the psyche the way that it wants to engage with us. And this is something the Jungians don't do very well at all. And it's an artifact of their theory and of their method, which makes it take so long. Whereas if you take a natural approach to the psyche, it will respond, it always responds, because the psyche is not divided from itself. It's a unitary field of different levels of consciousness that are processing things simultaneously. And the regulation of that field requires now and again for some kind of contact to be made consciously, that is to say from the normal everyday ego consciousness, towards what we might under other circumstances called the unconscious, but even Jung himself called that the non-ego conscious, which is a hint. The whole thing is conscious. If we do it naturally, then homeostasis, self-regulation, the way that the system wants to work, comes through unencumbered and uninterfered with by theory. So if we think of this so-called self-archetype, if that's real in any sense at all, then it must be accessible. Otherwise, it stands outside of homeostasis. It's something only of and to itself. That wouldn't work. However, the definitions that that Jung uses at various times in in his career and his writings suggest that it's supposed to be the centre and the circumference of the whole personality. And for such a thing to exist and to function, it must follow homeostatic rules and laws. So that system can communicate to and with itself and will do if we drop the idea that it's difficult to do so. In other words, it's easy. And this is something that Jungians find so, so difficult to accept, how easy it is to access what they believe is the self. And the master of this, the person who laid down just how simple and natural that was, was Milton H. Erickson, who was a psychiatrist, and probably against any measure that I can regard the most significant hypnotherapist of the 20th century, without a shadow of a doubt. The guy was not psychoanalytically or even psychodynamically trained as such. He was an absolute natural. It emerged out from him. And basically what he's taught is that the concept of rapport, which has been common in medicine and healing and therapy for centuries, is the absolute core of everything. If you gain rapport with that part of yourself, which is not the you that you experience as as your conscious personality, then communication flows straight away and it moves towards uh, homeostasis. So if we do it naturally, it's quick. You can log on to this so-called self archetype. When you've done it enough in seconds, it's that quick and you can get a regulatory response coming back from it. It does not take years. You do not have to go through the process of confronting this so-called shadow. You do not have to go through the process of confronting and integrating this so-called anima or animus before you get anywhere near what Jung understood to be the self-archetype. It is present all the time. And... That's the theoretical statement that I will make, if you like, before we actually move into the how. But it is very, very quick when you do it properly. And once you have that connection with homeostasis, you don't want to let it go. You don't want to put you know, more theoretical constructs in the way of your actual self-regulation. That's the kind of thing which uh, a conscious personality, usually an intellectualized one, is far too preoccupied with instead of the task of living which is the most important thing for any of us. Yeah, well, the question for me is, why would you want to do that? If you were a young analyst, why would you want to drag things out Uh, uh, for years? Uh, There's also the possibility in that too, that they actually know that it can be quicker and they're not prepared to share that. That's a possibility too. It is, yeah. Because, you know, it's, it's, 
Jungian analysis is something of a closed shop, isn't it? In the sense that it's considered to be something elite and uh, those who engage in it elevate themselves by being in therapy for, for months and years at a time. And we have personal friends who are like that. Yeah. They are actually see it as being a kind of badge of honour almost that they have been in therapy for a very long time and that they can boast about having a um you know an analyst that they go to on a regular basis it actually forms part of their their self-concept it does yeah so what well, and it's not the only example of that kind of thing I mean, you've got a background in in traditional chinese martial arts mm. and you know that within that system that things are withheld oh yeah by yeah. people who are, are you know very experienced in it they know that for example with say something like qigong mm -hmm. that it is possible to do that if you know what to do relatively quickly and easily Very, yeah. but they withhold this they do yeah and obviously yeah. they do that yeah. for their own reasons so yeah. our view has always been never to withhold anything mm. clinically that, mm. that we know to work mm. personally we've mm. always wanted to share that mm. with the people that we've worked with yeah and as you rightly say uh, Milton Erickson's um you know work is the, the, the sine qua non for that really in in mm. terms of accessing the unconscious yeah. and uh doing that quickly yeah there's no doubt about that that it is yeah. very very effective mm. very quick clinically yeah. and anyone can do this if mm. they know what to do yeah it's simple you just have to... should not be withheld i guess is what no. i'm trying to say yeah, you have to build up the skill of being able to ask in the right way you do yes um yeah. so there are protocols mm which once you get into it, the feedback you get is remarkable. And it doesn't feel like it's some kind of little inner reified personality running around in your head or some imaginary wise old man or wise old woman figure. You feel this with your whole being and the communication comes directly to you and the results are very, very quick. What it does do as well is to avoid inflation because when people identify with these constructs which are caused by the theory that they adopt and internalize, you know, these imaginary uh, mythological figures as if they were real, once you do that, you partition off your own psyche, you basically generate a complex around that construct uh, and that siphons off your energy, it siphons off your attention, it uh, lowers your capacity to adapt. All of those things, whereas if you know how to contact that self-regulating centre directly and appropriately, and then you respond in the right way to the feedback that you get, you make progress. If it weren't that way, it would be contraindicated for evolution, for example, because we'd be too busy being navel-gazing to adapt, as I say, to the task of survival and of building a culture and maintaining that and, and uh, passing on knowledge and information so the thing is broken really from the very first the very first based the notion uh, that we have to do that kind of thing you may be wondering why doesn't this have to take a long time that's quite the pacing and leading question let's flip it around to see the truth of what's underneath it why do many believe it has to take a long time in the first place there are two reasons for this 101 error, not relating to our own ego properly and not relating to the so-called unconscious properly. Both are very often deeply intertwined. What people need to know is that they have to have a, a, an ego. They've got or an ego, whatever you want to call it, that you've got to have one. Um, and it has to be malleable enough to adapt to different situations. That's what Jung collapsed into his representation of a persona. But it's quite awkward, really. Jung's construct of that is awkward. And it easily gets distracted, displaced and inflated into something which it isn't. It's a membrane that we have to maintain. It's a boundary, a systems boundary, an interface. We have to have that and we have to have different variants of it but know that we have continuity behind those different variations. If, if we don't, then we disidentify with them and then they run autonomously. And then you see what Jung describes, but it's a pathological representation of a maladaptation by split off parts of uh, ourselves that don't function in relationship to the ego psychosocially. So we get pulled all over the place. That means that sometimes we will be over adapting to others 
we'll reduce our place in a hierarchy, for example, or we'll overamp it, or we'll be open to suggestion and influence inappropriately, that kind of thing. And then you get all of all of these other constructs like the shadow and the anima coming in as uh, justifications for simply poorly relating in that ordinary psychosocial sense. But they're, they're, they're second, they're downstream uh, justifications for a, an elementary uh, maladaptation. So the key is that the ancestral psyche, however we want to model that, anticipates our lifespan, which, which you've said in, in, in the other videos, and that, that, that's entirely right. And the so-called unconscious would, under normal conditions, rather be left alone by the ego, and the ego should do its job. The unconscious will then, so-called unconscious, will pressure us to adapt further, but it will accept if the ego just uh, judges properly. I can't do this, it'll end my life, you know? Yeah. So on the inside, please tone down. Now the inside will tone down if homeostasis as a whole judges that the ego is doing its job. If it says the ego is not doing its job properly, then it can't trust the ego and it'll push harder. And from that, all the psychodynamics of projection, transference and everything start to emerge and all the, the issues of maladaptation emerge. But when we get hold of meta instincts consciously by receiving them and understanding their power and intentionality, it reinforces the ego to move away from introspection and out into adaptation into the world. The unconscious is happy with that because that's why the ego exists. So it seems a key thing to emphasize is then, if I'm understanding you right, would be that the uh, the meta instincts won't respond and the unconscious won't respond if the ego isn't isn't consolidated properly. Basically, yeah. so if, if it's distracted by its complexes or its fantasies or its whatevers, yeah, it, it may have a stable ego, but it's not it's not ready to receive. Basically, so it won't respond positively or respond in the typical way that that Jungians see things in a compensatory manner. The compensation is for the maladaptation. So that's when we start to feel anxiety as a drive state. Mm. You know, anxiety is not an emotion. It's, it's the perception of being in a drive state. Mm. That's all it is. And it's the desire to do work in, in terms of neuropsychoanalysis, to solve the drive state by meeting needs. So even if we just collapse into neuropsychoanalysis, we can see there's congruence there. If someone feels anxious, if it's not about a specific thing which is real and imminent, if it's a general anxiety disorder, as this thing used to be called, then there are instinctive needs that are not being met. They're not being met because the ego is not adapting and it's defended by complexes which turn on the ego itself in a psychological autoimmune response to the maladaptation. So everything starts to go wrong. Homeostasis is broken down. Whereas if you get seeking right, um, you feel empowered, you, your energy is appropriately distributed for life's tasks. And uh, intuition is definitely something which will parallel with seeking. I, I'm sure they've evolved to be complementary to one another because mm. functionally they're, they're set up to do pretty much the same yeah. thing. Mm. Seeking gives you the energy to realize intuition. Mm. And intuition is perception of the needs of the entire scenario, therefore of the complete meta instinct that you are unconsciously occupying at that moment. And that's the key. I don't know why I'm in this state. Well, if you if you had a connection to meta instincts, the internal representation that you would receive from within would appear to be intuition. And it is because you've been congruent with the whole system's regulation. So oh, I'm suddenly inspired to do something because, yes, you're receiving the representation that's behind the drive of the instinctive need for adaptation that's presenting itself. But if you avoid all that and go off into fantasy, mm -hmm. you bleed a bit of it off, you know, it'll be perfected. Uh, but the system as a whole will not like that and it will come for you. It's another reason to reject standard personality theory, isn't it? Yeah. Because otherwise, we're, what are we saying? We're saying one half of the population uh, cannot access yeah. intuition yeah. in that way and, and pair it with the seeking, seeking yeah. system therefore uh you know they're going to be deprived of the opportunity to to operate in yeah. that way in the outside world you, you i mean that would be what you yeah. were suggesting if you were to follow that yeah all the way down absolutely and clearly that's not the case and 
the suggestive power of that is huge. Mm. I mean, I, I feel that um, not being a, a standard intuitive type on the Myers-Briggs. Yeah. And it, it's something that's kind of dogged me all my clinical life. It, you know, I've just felt instinctively that that was wrong. Yeah. And uh, we can all access the field. Yes. And we, we can all choose to team that up with our seeking system yeah and then we get things done yeah they're all neurotic in a big way they are neurotic all of them but all, it's, i think it's as well to say it because yeah, absolutely the suggestive power that is huge it, it's contra to young's principle of individuation yeah end is. of it just it is. Is. Yes, it, it, it is like yeah the, mm. the these incps and incjs the, they believe they are because they score that way on the Myers Briggs. Mm. Want young to be one of them because they are one of them, yeah. and then that's it. And then they ossify and collapse around that. That's a neurosis. If if he the force of himself in that way at the end of his life, mm. then by the logic of his own model, he would have failed yeah. to individuate. Mm. But he even said such things as, "I no longer need the insinuations of the anima." He's claiming there that he understands feeling. He understands his anima. And if his anima is de defined by the opposite of an INTJ or INTP, then he's integrated it. Therefore, he's not an INTP or an INTJ. Yeah. The whole thing collapses mm. because they are reductionisms and they're based on a neurotic, you know, uh, collapse into a particular type. But if you're interested in individuation, you know, the, the calling of Jung's uh, path, then what you have to do is to understand what typology is and understand further that it collapses into typeism, whereby we attack other people for being different to us mm -hmm. and we, we arrest our own development. Yeah. Then we have to take the next step, which is what are they actually? What are these, these representational qualia of consciousness? Where do they come from and in what order did they evolve? And when we get that, we have a completely different perspective on what so-called type is. Mm. You never meant it to be used like this. Yeah. So we can't really use them as a justification for the Myers-Briggs or for any of its derivatives, including any of these contemporary internet gurus who build their whole life around that and on its elaboration. Now, working with real people who know nothing about type theories, but you see these quality of representational consciousness coming through, which illustrates where they're at on the, their own journey tells you a great deal, a, an awful lot about what they need to do to develop and what their potentiality is. But to collapse into a type is to be neurotic. That's the big takeaway. And then you have to do something about it. Steve and Pauline spoke on a lot there. Let's take a quick moment to explore it and do it justice. The culture makes many of us implicitly believe that this cognition is or should be the normal state of the ego. So we think about things and try and solve problems by running virtual models and thinking through them. Cognitive Behavioural Therapy, or CBT, is a good example to highlight this. Whenever we feel bad in that model, then it must be to do with our thinking being faulty. So we should address it by trying to change the way that we think. Neither neuroscience nor psychodynamics supports this view. Instead, wherever we have cognition, so thinking of any kind, there is always affect superpositioned with it. Specifically, we know that affect is 2 milliseconds faster than cognition. It fires forth from the older areas of the brain, so psychodynamically an instinct, and pushes on cognition to solve an adaptive challenge. We might only be subjectively aware of the cognition as the specific representation of information within the subjective waveform, and might not even be aware of what the adaptive problem is in the first place. But superpositioned with cognition is always affect, as, as Steve says, the carrier wave of instinct. Steve and Pauline have a very interesting thought experiment to illustrate quite how important this is. Cognition, for many of us today, might be the dominant identified with qualia of ego consciousness, but rewinding the evolutionary clock back to our ancient hominid ancestors, the opposite would have been the case. Affect, as the communication from instinct, would have been dominant and our evolving cognition subordinate to it. 
A neurosis today is very often viewed by the person experiencing it as affect intruding in on cognition, making its own demands so that the person doesn't understand why they're feeling the way that they are at all. For our Paleolithic ancestors, however, a neurosis would have been our nascent evolving cognition intruding in on affect. This thought experiment flips any cognition-reductive understanding of the human experience completely on its head, and provides us with an essential stepping stone for accessing meta-instinct. Affect is the carrier wave of instinct, and cognition evolved later. Another way of looking at this is that our contemporary over-identification with cognition is simply a subjective waveform collapse that prevents consciousness of the reality of the living ancestral psyche. Our unconscious is very, very similar to the unconscious of our Paleolithic ancestors. Our meta-instincts are their meta-instincts. With an eye for superpositioning, it's very clear to see that what our Paleolithic ancestors did, day to day, we still do. When complexes cause us to split off from this connection, neurosis results. But beneath the surface, that potential for connection is always there. on instinct and archetype in contemporary events. Steve writes, quote, There's an opportunity with unfolding contemporary events to observe the manipulation of instincts in collective psychology. The Adlerian level is concealing the Freudian pathology powering up and through, whilst inflating into a Jungian level of pathological unconsciousness. Like the eruption column of a volcano, the collapse under its own weight could lead to a catastrophic pyroclastic flow of Adlerian political pathology into a frenzy of Freudian destructive instinct. The collective genome and its related fields, which we've warned about, is quite capable of orchestrating this potential catastrophe. History shows that politicians are only the efficient cause of a teleology utterly outside of their comprehension or control. Unless there is a real engaged understanding of the overwhelming deterministic power of unconscious instinct, which is intrinsically conscious but not ego-conscious, then tidal forces will push upward from below in an attempt to reset the gene pool at local, regional and or global levels. Meta-instincts are not only positive. They have been shaped by the past experience of the genome and anticipate its Darwinian self-regulation. So-called archetypes will make their representational appearance as justifications at the Jungian collective pathological level. Jung understood in his own words that, quote, archetypes are the self-portrait of the instincts. They are produced as representations of the instincts, by the instincts, superpositioned at all biopsychosocial levels. But what actually fights? What powers the whole unfolding narrative? What underpins every political justification? Not archetypes, but instincts. Be as objective as you possibly can. Be as conscious as you possibly can. Learn as deeply as you possibly can. The micro and macro levels of these processes are fundamentally scale invariant. Field effects are real. It takes consciousness of a subjective kind to begin to bring about change at the collective level. Take the opportunity for insight. It's all around you. On narrative and the teleology of consciousness. Steve writes, quote, Human ego-consciousness requires a narrative state in order to get beyond a collapse into itself. 
Biology, so Darwin, makes this an adaptive imperative. Plato is both its formal cause, as its anticipation, and its final telic cause, in that the goal of narrative representational psychodynamics is the ultimate completion of the ontology of consciousness through incremental progression. At the subjective level, this is Jung's individuation process. At the objective level, it's the teleology of consciousness as such. Narrative is the representation of teleology, superpositioned into all states that it can occupy. On Platonic Forms and Darwin, Steve writes, quote, The everyday understanding of what we mean by Platonic manifests through Darwin as distilled into a meta-instinctual context. Plato seeks Darwin. Darwin conceals Plato. The soul transcends and unites them both. Plato's imperfect intuition was a deep structure apperception of meta-instinct, as a representation of that which underpins it. Fantasy is a holding space for representations too big to unpack into ego consciousness, so they remain as symbols, as in dreams, or displaced into systematised processes, ranging from normal reverie to myth through ritualised pop culture fantasies, and on into delusions and psychosis. Platonic ideas are very big, hence they perforce seek Darwin to bring them into actualization. Meta-instincts have developed through evolution to self-regulate the ontology of Platonic forms into material reality. Keep an eye out for fantasies, as these may just unpack themselves into representations you or others cannot control. Don't lose sight of meta-instincts, or fail to understand their purpose. Myths, true myths, are not fantasies. The meta-instincts that underpin them are the dreams of the genome, directed by field forces that are only apprehended by intuition, in that platonic sense. On Pansepian instincts, complexes, and meta-instincts, Steve writes, quote, Meta instincts are whole scenarios, and each provides a genomically anticipated context for the expression of many pansepian instincts. This is why memories, as systems of biopsychosocial information, contain many pansepian instincts, and why meta instincts are the evolutionary anticipation of, and solution for, complexes which are systems of acquired memories, learning, and behaviour. These complexes can range from reactive, such as trauma, through to negative conditioning, habits, and collapsed loop cognition. Even psychotic states manifest as what Jung called autonomous complexes. Meta-instincts are on timed release from the genome and are rehearsed developmentally through symbolic psychosocial play. Pansepian instincts without a proper meta-instinctive context will fire randomly. This increases the general drive state of a person, leading to agitation, distress, depression and withdrawal. In short, the whole bandwidth of maladaptive and neurotic states that people can suffer from. On wounded instinct, Steve writes, quote, The difficulties with generalisms include that they seldom fit with specifics. However, without them, there is rarely a basis for building an understanding. The common separation between instinct and cognition, so prevalent today, is a major cause and sustaining factor in neurosis. In a therapeutic or personal development context, instinct refers to accessing homeostatic regulatory processes that scale through the whole biopsychosocial continuum, that is, a human life. Following a wound to a reinforcing instinct, or worse still, to their corruption due to conditioning and suggestion, is not homeostatic. 
The key to understanding instinct is not in their fundamental expression, or motivation, that is, drives, but in their context. These contexts, or meta-instincts, provide the anticipated solution to wounded instincts and learned maladaptations. Instincts at their most fundamental will accept suboptimal adaptation, so long as it serves some level of survival and function. Meta-instincts, however, provide the anticipated lifespan development scenario for optimizing potential. Basic instincts and emotional systems, so PANCEP, provide for general survival and adaptation. Meta-instincts develop these into whole-of-life adaptation. Panxepian instincts, without an appropriate meta-instinctive context, fire randomly and generate conflict, such as basic Freudian compensations and neurosis. The difference is significant. On Thanatos, Steve writes, quote, Thanatos as a concept and even more so as a fact of the human condition, has been a very difficult topic for therapists of all persuasions. Freud did not originate the idea. That came from Sabina Spielrein, with whom Jung had a very unprofessional relationship, before Tony Wolfe. She was a patient of Jung's, and later became a Freudian psychoanalyst. It was her influence on Freud after his experience of family loss in the First World War, that led him to conjecture a death drive. Freud's followers coined the term death instinct after Thanatos. Humanistic and transpersonal psychotherapies, and most psychoanalysts, tend to deny or avoid that such a thing as a death instinct could exist. Our view on this is empirical, and given the wider biological and clinical perspective, it is a real factor that can manifest at various levels in the psychosocial and psychobiological domains of life. I would not agree with the notion that it's just Eros trapped in the body. True Thanatos, where it is at its maximum resolution, converts Eros into itself. The mechanism is independent of Eros as such, and comes directly from the genome and gene expression, in concert with extrinsic factors in the social and natural environment. Somatic expression or symbolic representation at the level suggested by Reich is not the same thing. The issue is superpositioned and not reducible to a pooling of libido or information, in a somatic symptom or configuration. On mythopoetic identification, Steve writes, quote, The dangers in mythopoetic identification include such works as the Iliad and the Odyssey. They have a representational range of the human condition, similar to that of Shakespeare, which is what makes them great, but the narratives are so strong that they can pace and lead the reader into a dissociative resonance, that is, in meta-instinctual correspondence with the extrinsic mythic narrative. This can then activate the release of things that the ego has never experienced, but come into affective association to it by correspondence with its complexes. The result can often be the opposite of the healing function of myth, by induction of a fantastical inflation, not of a stable ego, but one prone to the suggestion of dissociation, betrayal, tragedy and death. The virtual playground of myth should never be a substitute for healthy lifespan developmental adaptation. Do not tarry too long therein, unless your ego has an Ariadne thread with which to return back into the world. On the fall of the Roman Empire, a YouTube commenter asks, I would love to hear the commentary on the latest TikTok trend of women asking their partners how often they think about the Roman Empire. Steve replies on the 18th of October 2023. 
25 years ago, Pauline and I were making the prediction that the collective West would very likely go the way of the Western Roman Empire in the 4th and 5th centuries AD, unless an enantiodromia were to set in. Not a difficult prediction, if you're informed by Jungian depth psychology and an understanding of history. This current TikTok trend will have a generating dynamic outside of the collective consciousness of those that manifest it. The superpositioning of consciousness extends beyond the ego, even the collective ego, as it originates at the level of the collective field of the human genome. That is, it is a species-wide field-resonant phenomenon, subject to testing at the Darwinian register of homeostasis. Its surface manifestation, locally collapsed into TikTok, is orchestrated by a specific part of the dynamic principle of homeostasis, that which is reified or personified as the trickster. The opportunity for self-correction at the individual and collective level is that which the trickster conceals within parody, irony and the invitation to self-delete, at all scale invariant, individual and cultural levels of resolution. Just like in our analysis of Botticelli's art, Venus, Primavera and Athena, what you get is far more than what you see. On Archetypes and the Ontology of the Universe Steve writes, quote, Did or do Jung's anima and animus exist as a priori platonic forms? If so, does this imply that they, as manifest archetypes, were predetermined ontologically, and therefore human beings with their male, female, reproductive and relational complementary polarity were likewise anticipated many billions of years before human beings evolved out from a physical universe? Let's start by considering some contextual differences between a Platonic and Sheldrakean model of form. Plato's original conception of form was certainly a priori to any physical instantiation of them. They are the first and pure cause of anything that can be physical, albeit that any given physical representation of them is imperfect. This would include the relationship of Jung's archetypes, a term he borrowed and then recontextualized from Plato, of the feminine and masculine, or the anima animus. Sheldrake recently avoids a consideration of form in this way, saying that there is no Napoleonic code or law for form. Rather, he sees form as being imminent within material existence and developing through what he calls the habits of nature. Form and matter are, for Sheldrake, in a field-resonant relationship to one another, to the extent that form can be determined by such morphic resonance and formative causation. In this, he is perhaps much closer to Aristotle and his doctrine of four causes than he is to Plato. How does informational monism and superposition theory see the contrasting positions of Plato and Sheldrake? We see Plato's intuited eternal world of forms as being the underlying and prime causative field of information that produces the ontology of the material world, but that it is not fixed. That is, it is not unchanging. There is a continuity then between Platonic and Sheldrakean fields, that is both ontological and dialectical. Plato is the foundational and primary causative field, which has within it the embedded ontological dynamic that brings Sheldrake into being. Sheldrakean fields, formative and behavioural, interact dialectically with the Platonic field, so that the Platonic field itself can, and is, updated by ontological feedback. This then allows a Platonic representation of the relationship between the biological sexes to exist within the Platonic field, and via Sheldrakean field effects to generate morphic and behavioural representations of these in local psychosocial representative form as well as, of course, in genetically and epigenetically representative states. This accounts for the representations of the anima and animus, as understood by Jung, both as archetype in itself and as archetypal image. 
Plato's original intuition was his apperception of the field that bears his name, as standing behind the directly experienceable form of the senses. His dialectical method was a system of active reasoning that proceeded from intuition to an affect-based gnosis of the underpinning reality of the phenomenal world. The cognitive element in the Socratic dialectic of feasting on the forms was and is downstream of the primary intuitive and affective representation of consciousness of the forms. Jung's anima animus model is very much an iteration of this, as made manifest through Jung's character and personality, but it is entirely congruent with it. Sheldrake offers the potential to understand more of how Plato becomes Jung. However, neither Jung himself, nor indeed Sheldrake, offer a method of access to and integration of Plato that includes Sheldrake. Informational monism and superpositioning theory do offer both this access and this integration. Both Plato and Sheldrake are seen as contiguous with one another. That is, the same fundamental ontological and feedback process of informational representation. The objective and subjective waveforms of informational representation meet in the representational psychodynamics experienced either directly by the ego and or by the wider field of consciousness that collapses into the non-ego consciousness of the individual and collective human psyche. If nature, and therefore the platonic Sheldrakean fields, have a memory, as per Sheldrake, then future cyclical or ontological universes will have in their causative platonic informational field a memory as an ontology and anticipation of the telic, or final goal state, of that universe, which in our case might well include Jung's representation of what he called the anima, and the animus. If so, then the gods really do exist in a transpersonal realm, aka the pleroma of the Gnostics, themselves caused as a priori ontological representations of a world or worlds that existed before. There is some correspondence here with Sir Roger Penrose's ideas about cyclical universes, and of course his platonic model of consciousness. The answer will be found in the psyche of human beings, within which will be layered representational psychodynamics of the evolution of this universe, and of consciousness itself. Naturally, in a literal sense, these will emerge into superpositioned representation in myths, culture, science, and of course, metaphysics. We only have to look. To extend the analogy from physics, the Large Hadron Collider uncovers hidden but still contiguous layers of reality within elementary particles by colliding them together and seeing what emerges from within. Likewise, in those who suffer psychologically, the breakdown can reveal that which is normally hidden as symbolic representations of the deeper structure of the universe. The psyche is not only archaeological, it is not only evolutionary, it is ontological too. The key here is to bring Plato and Sheldrake into continuity. They seem separate if either or both are taken to be discrete states, so collapsed, rather than contiguous, but collapsed. It's the representation that separates them. If Penrose is right about cyclical universes conserving at least some information between them, then at a platonic level, the ontological field would conserve a kind of Sheldrakean memory, so morphic and behavioural, of previous states, which through conservation act as if Plato's eternal world of forms. That field or world would then exist and function as if, as intuited by Plato. Sheldrake would seem to emerge ontologically out from materiality, but also be imminent with it. Regarding the platonic anticipation of mate selection in higher animals, then by inference, yes, as observation suggests, that this is indeed the case. Just as it seems that domestic canine meta-instincts now anticipate relating to humans, and vice versa. The role of selective breeding, 
at the genetic selection level will also involve Sheldrakian field representations, associated to the genome of the species in question. It is suggested that the feedback from Sheldrake into the platonic in this world would be sufficiently conserved for it to be latent in a future world. So the separation between Sheldrake and Plato is one made by collapsed observation, rather than collapse of the thing in itself. Thus Plato and Sheldrake as fields are contiguous and superpositioned, with one another. Jung's intuition through his subjective waveform collapse generated his representational psychodynamic constructs, which were his understanding of his own apperception. So the psyche has archaeological, that's cultural, evolutionary, biological, and ontological, so formal informational, layers. Jung understood the first two as linked, and hinted at the third being linked to the first two, but did not attempt a true synthesis of them. Informational monism and superpositioning theory provide the linking synthesis. On accessing meta-instincts through deep structure complexes. Steve writes, quote, When we, the ego, are ready, deep structure complexes can, and often will, spontaneously enter into ego consciousness, with a representation of the meta-instincts they latently represent. Deep structure complexes are not only passive mirrors, their obverse side is the immediate interface with the field of meta-instincts. A door is a portal between two domains. The port reeve, or guardian of the doorway to the meta-instincts, is often a reified representation, familiar to the ego. How the ego relates to that reification will determine if it can pass through the portal, into the meta-instinct field. This is the origin of cultural, mythopoetic narratives, concerning such boundaries and the question that must be answered in order to pass through. Frequently, if the ego is not yet fully ready, then the trickster function will appear as the port reeve, and test the ego's capacity to understand the psyche as being other than itself. That is, to test the ego's internal projections. The superpositioning of what is within and what is without is the origin of collective cultural representations. These the ego will readily project internally, over the non-ego or unconscious psyche. Then it meets its own image, reflected back to itself, and if at that point it merely settles for a narcissistic gaze at its own reflection, it will get no further, even though the reflection invites the ego to engage with it, and see past it. At the core of every archetypal image is not an archetype, but a deep structure complex, at the core of every complex is not an archetype, but a meta-instinct. When we finally understand this, we find that actually there is no core, only a configuration of an informational field. We create a hierarchical systems model through our method of observation. Information is indeed most practically modelled as being organised into nested levels of analysis, description and explanation. But the necessary consequence of Engel's work and clinical insight is that the essence of these systems levels is in the dynamic superpositioning of information as a field. When is a door not a door? When the illusion of it opens out into an open field. So the key is to understand that what passes as archetypal images most often are not. Meta-instincts are capable of spontaneous representation of themselves directly without the intermediary of deep structure complexes. When they do, then the experience is profound. Deep structure complexes tend to be more field embedded, in a way that the ego can relate to in a familiar way. A normally functioning ego can easily understand this through its own associations. Meta-instincts, however, when they emerge spontaneously under their own genomic lifespan development pressure, have a transcendent or transpersonal quality to them, characterised by a different qualia of consciousness. These experiences are analogous to Jung's experience of an archetype, 
but without the pop psychology reifications and collective stereotypes that are usually associated with them. Accessing meta-instincts through deep structure complexes is a progressive dialectical process, with various methods being applicable to this. On why we have evolved deep structure complexes. Steve writes, quote, Deep structure complexes are a necessary intermediate, psychostructurally, that serve a homeostatic purpose in regulating communication between ego and meta-instincts. Given that meta-instincts are the representational form and dynamic of the timed release ontology of the genome over lifespan development. If the deep structure complexes did not form in this regulating way, there'd be a gap problem between the ego and the so-called unconscious. The ego, of course, would then internally project itself into that gap and fill it with dissociated images of itself and its fantasies including Jungian archetypes. This is why deep structure complexes reflect back to the ego the mirror image of its fantasies and reifications, whilst offering a portal to pass through into the true non-ego consciousness of the unconscious. Examples of this are found in many traditional cultures, such as in Hindu and Buddhist Tantra. Deep structure complexes do not only passively reflect the state of the ego back to itself, they take direct homeostatic compensatory action and, under meta-instinctive pressure, present the ego with a formalised representation of its own beliefs about its one-sidedness. Hence the Jungian deep structure suggestion of a reified shadow, which if taken as such, is contra-biological, in that it has all the negative and self-destructive traits that run contrary to optimised biological survival. Its appearance as a reified subpersonality is dependent upon internalised and internally projected beliefs. However, such a formulation can act homeostatically, to regulate the ego, whilst paradoxically acting to suggest to the ego that it can be transcended, which is the role of the Port Reeve that the deep structure complex of the Jungian shadow offers as being the resolution to itself i.e. it is the door to its own meta-instinctive solution. On the ego's relationship to meta-instinct, Steve writes, quote, The ego evolved out from the meta-instinctive field. Meta-instincts evolve with consciousness in all life forms capable of having meta-instincts. But meta-instincts preceded contemporary human ego consciousness, and it was in adaptation to the meta-instincts that evolution developed what we understand today as our cognitive reflexive sense of identity, or our ego. A drawback of this is that the contemporary ego habitually collapses into itself as a figure that tries to exist without reference to its ground. This is typical of academics, such as philosophers, neuroscientists, psychologists, and many proponents of analytic psychotherapy, so psychoanalysts and Jungian analytical psychologists. Their presumption is that consciousness can only be a version of human, rational, cognitive, ego consciousness. However, any ethological understanding of social mammals in their natural environment will summarily dismiss this fallacy, as will any non-retrospective projection of our contemporary consciousness back into human evolution, so as to reveal the ancestral mind as it really was. The Paleolithic psyche is real, and has been conserved and superpositioned decisively with our modern consciousness. Pansepian instincts are conserved across all species that have the brain structures and underlying genome and fields to manifest them. But Pansepian instincts in human beings have a human phylogenetic and telic intentionality, and as a result have a definitive human meta-instinctual context. In other words, both Pansepian instincts and meta-instincts evolve in lockstep with the human brain in response to its environment, biopsychosocially. I've published on this in a bulletin report to the journal Neuropsychoanalysis, which is peer-reviewed. Pauline and I will be developing this further with the neuropsychoanalysts and with the human ethologists in a forthcoming paper, 
titled From Archetype to Meta Instinct, Human Ethology in the Clinical Domain. This is in press. Once the reciprocal evolutionary field is established between genome, platonic and Sheldrakean fields, brain and psyche, then each can update the other and conserve across time. On the anticipations of the genome. Steve writes, quote, From a developmental perspective, meta-instinctive scenarios are anticipated, rehearsed, and incrementally released against environmental opportunities. Think of the ethological model of innate releasing mechanism and the environmental sign stimulus, which in psychosystems analysis are modelled as the innate releasing mechanism actively seeking out the corresponding sign stimulus. There is seldom a perfect match between innate pressure for release and external opportunity, so Darwin steps in with selective competition as an efficient cause. Pansepian instincts are heavily invested with drive pressure, as they form the basic modes of apprehension that Jung attributed to archetypes. Jung's understanding of drives was fundamentally 19th century, mechanistic and biologically reductive, without the understanding of genetics, ethology, and the superpositioning of biology with psychology and the social and natural environment that is available today. Hence, he divided instinct from archetype, whilst intuiting his construct of archetypes as an explanation for the interaction between Pansepian and meta-instincts, as these are understood today. So collapsed classifications become problematic. It's best to consider Pansep as representing basic, as he himself said, emotional systems, or instincts, that form an extension of homeostasis beyond the body through action in the world. Reference here to Mark Solms and the neuropsychoanalysts. These are congruent with Jung's modes of action, as he understood the dynamics of instinct to be. However, the human context for Pansep extends beyond the basic into genomic, anticipated, meta-instinctive, so meaningful and necessary, scenarios that have evolved as uniquely human adaptive preparations for lifespan development. Jung's analogue for these are archetypes, but unlike archetypes, meta-instincts are not collapsible into psychologisms, fantasy representations, or sublimated symbols. They satisfy ethology, evolutionary biology, clinical psychotherapy, and whole-of-life development. So in humans, Pansepian drives are contiguous with their anticipated meta-instinctive context. Misfiring can occur when maturation is delayed, inhibited by neurosis, for example, or restricted by conditioning and lack of psychosocial opportunity. Some disease processes such as dementia or brain damage following stroke can cause Pansepian disinhibition in inappropriate contexts. In short, Pansepian drives are intended, so telic, to find their meta-instinctive context and fulfilment as one superpositioned, contiguous process. The human context has evolved, hence our instincts have evolved to reflect this. The basics, as represented by Pansep, have evolved through their prepared meta-instinctive contexts. So, Pansep is adjusted to meet the evolution of meta-instinctive scenarios. The meta-instinctive information is held genetically, epigenetically, and within Sheldrakean and Platonic fields. Superpositioning generates foci-specific representations within the whole field, which then replicate over time. Hence, these representations may be genetic or field modifications, or indeed both. The status of the field as a whole is what matters, as its regulation orders the representation of the whole. The platonic field is not a closed system with a unidirectional ontology. It can be updated via what represents as Sheldrakean field dynamics, so formative causation and morphogenesis. The result is described by the superpositioning of information within any discrete system or state with the dynamics of informational field representation and exchange being the phenomenal experience of both teleology and ontology. <laughs>